Good morning, Jacksonville, Duval County. Welcome to Jacksport's annual Small Emerging Business Appreciation Day. Um, this is our third annual event. Uh, many of you uh, have taken part in the past, and we're here today to bring you more up-to-date information on how to make your business successful in Jacksonville. Um, I wanna take out this time just real briefly to let you know that as everybody knows, we made a big pivot uh, with COVID. And part of that pivot is virtual meetings. Um, and so this is my first, so forgive me if I stumble a little bit, uh, but I, I just want you to know that we're all excited here. And one of the reasons why I'm excited is because um, Jacksport wants to be a leader in small business development uh, in, the, in the city. Jacksport wants to be a leader uh, in Duval. Um, we want to make sure that we are the economic generator. So in that, we want to share information with you that's about making your business successful. And what makes Jack Sports business successful uh, for me is the fact that I have um, total support um, from the top of the organization down. One of the first persons I met when I came uh, was our chair, uh, Dr. Newman, um, but I have full support of my director, Jackie Glass, um, my CFO, Beth McKay, and the man I'm getting ready to introduce you now, which is uh, our CEO. I'm so excited that Mr. Green is here and uh, was is participating. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring Mr. Green. Thank you, Brian, and what a great job you're doing. Um, good morning and thank you for joining us for Jacksport's third annual Small and Emerging Business Appreciation Day. This event is a yearly tradition for us as we work to connect our small business community with the opportunities at the port and throughout the city of Jacksonville. I want to thank Jacksonville City Councilman and Small Business Advocate Terrence Freeman for joining us today. In just a moment, Councilman Freeman will discuss the big role small business play in Jacksonville's current and future growth. But first, for those of you who aren't familiar with Jacksport, here's a little background on us. Jacksport is Northeast Florida's economic engine, creating jobs and opportunity for business like yours is a central part of our mission. We are Florida's number one container port. More containers move through Jacksonville than any port in the state. We are also one of the nation's top vehicle handling ports. Cargo activity through Jacksonville Seaport supports more than 26,000 jobs right here in our community. As cargo volumes grow, the opportunities available to small businesses expand as well. Over the last six years, Jacksport payments for work by certified Jacksonville small and emerging businesses have topped $31 million. Jacksport has a number of exciting growth projects on the horizon, including 70 million in terminal enhancements set to begin this year at Blunt Island. We anticipate small businesses playing a role in that project, but it doesn't end there. Small business opportunities at Jacksport often include a wide range of services, including things like engineering, electrical, maintenance, training, consulting, security, and more. We know that the pandemic has changed the way you do business. Events, including this one, have migrated online, at least for now. That's why we're working to help you adapt. We have a full program plan for you today, including advice for connecting with business opportunities in today's virtual businesses, business environment, a procurement panel with representatives from Jacksonville's public agencies, and tips for navigating the federal relief programs currently in place to help small business navigate the pandemic. It is our mission to connect you with opportunities at the port and beyond. Let us be a resource for you. Reach out to Jacksport's Director of Procurement Services, Jackie Glass, and our SEB Programs Coordinator, Brian Williams. We are here to support you. Thank you. All righty, thank you, uh, Eric. I, I, I get uh, formal on these uh, meetings. It's a formal introduction, um, but uh, 
Mr. Green is so open um, that you know we're all comfortable with speaking with him and sharing our interests in small business. So I want to thank you again uh, for participating. So right now we're going to move on to our first speaker. We have quite a busy agenda. Um, so the first person I want to introduce you to um, is, is our councilman, uh, Terrence Freeman. Uh, and just a little background on Mr. Freeman. Uh, a lot of you might not know that he was a former professional baseball player with the Pittsburgh Pirate Organization. I bring that up because everybody knows I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. But he has worked very hard uh, in his non-athletic career to bring uh, business uh, as a forefront, small business as a forefront in Jacksonville. In 2016, uh, Mr. Freeman ran for councilman. Uh, unfortunately for the city of Jacksonville, he lost, but he did not give up hope. He came back again and was appointed to city council uh, by our governor and our mayor, and he has been uh, on the council since. He also uh, then in 2018 uh, ran again and has become our city councilman at large, which means he speaks um, not only for his local constituents, but the city as well. And so one of the reasons I wanted to bring him on today is Mr. Freeman is also part of a subcommittee um, in the development of increasing and um, enhancing the city JSAB program. So I am proud to have him here with me again today. Uh, Council Freeman, I will now turn the mic over to you. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. And thank you, Brian, for the uh, for the warm introduction. I tell you, I truly miss being in the room with each and every small business leader. Um, the energy that I draw from in that room uh, is something that I, I long for. Uh, so I'll do my best in this virtual setting uh, to try to supply a little bit of that energy that I'm used to getting when I look into your eyes. But I, I definitely want to thank Brian and and Eric Green and the team, uh, one, for having me back, and two, for the great work um, that you all are doing at the port. It is an example, truly, of getting it right. Um, I want to thank each and every small business leader uh, on the call. Uh, you all are the backbone of our city. Um, and I was trying to really figure out how I can condense all of the good stuff that's happening right now in the council. Um, in a brief time. And so I'll just get right to uh, the big item, which is Bill 2021-0117. Um, it's been filed and last night we voted uh, to sub and re-refer. So it goes back to finance uh, just so our colleagues can get a chance. But this is a bill where Council Member Pittman, Council Member Dennis and myself, who all happen to be working on various parts of just understanding and trying to create good policies for our city in the current state that we're in now, um, we came together in a subcommittee uh, and we spent the last five or six months really taking a deep dive into our JSEP program. And so I wanted to give you uh, just three big takeaways from it that I'm, I'm excited about uh, with the potential of all of the, the, the opportunities and business and growth that's gonna come in the next couple of years, um, really ensuring that you in the room and other small business leaders in our city um, are positioned to really take advantage of those opportunities and to no longer, um, and I apologize if you felt this way, feel like you've been left out. Um, so one of the, one of the big takeaways um, is we, we really took a look at shortening that time frame that it takes to get into the program. Um, and, and I don't want to go too deep into it because I know it's going back to committee and some of my colleagues, which I, I welcome and respect their thoughts and opinions, they may massage it a little bit, but, you know, initially when we looked at that, the legislation, um, it was a three-year period, um, and that's a bit much. Uh, you know, the example given of the foreman that has worked for a company for, for many, many years, has all of the expertise, um, now is ready to branch off on his own, and to ask him to step out and try to stand on his own against a lot of those um, companies that have been in established and they, they're established and they've been around for years, it just creates a, a, an unnecessary challenge. Uh, so we worked on shortening that time frame, and, and I think that we landed on a number 
that uh, I believe is fair uh, for all. Um, another one, and that was Councilman Dennis's um, contribution, among others. Uh, Councilmember Pittman uh, brought up an excellent point uh, when we talked about small business leaders uh, as they get into the program and, and they start experiencing some growth, um, which is good. We want that, right? We're creating jobs. Uh, we're, we're hiring people. They're, they're spending money in our communities. It's increasing our tax base so we can do more things for infrastructure and safety. Um, but the challenge was is whenever they hit that tier, that benchmark, all of a sudden they went from being a big fish in a little pond to now thrown into the ocean and they're a little fish in a big big, big pond, and they were big fish in a small pond in the first analogy. And so we really, really did a deep dive into that, and, and we're looking into a tiered program so that, one, you don't stay too long in that first tier. We need to, we need to create space for more small business leaders to come in, get on board, learn, grow, and create jobs. Um, and so we're looking at a three-tier program. Um, so I'm really excited about the opportunity of seeing small business leaders like yourself uh, get in, get established, experience success, but not kicked out. Now you're going to the next level and you're going to compete a little harder because you're at the bottom of that one, but you still have an opportunity to compete with companies that are right in your area of growth. Um, and then the third part, which was uh, a part that was really, really near and dear to me. Uh, we're living in a, in a society now where technology is, has really afforded us opportunity to be efficient. Um, it, it better enables us to meet people where they're at. Um, with the with the various um, things that they have going on. I'm a father of four daughters, right? My wife's a coach. I'm a small business owner myself. I'm a city council member. Uh, I formerly worked with the Boys and Girls Club. Now I'm with the nonprofit. I mean, there's a lot of things that I that are pulling at me. And so technology is really a foundation that can help me do what I need to do without taking too much time away from other things. And so uh, in meeting with a third-party vendor, uh, we are excited about a blockchain a model that we're going to bring in. And, and what excites me the most about this is this is where we can take some small business leaders who are really at that infancy stage of business and, and onboard them, bring them in. And as we take them through this cycle, they're getting not only introduced to, to the things that are going to really help them uh, establish their business and grow it, but they're getting hands-on help um, with the use of technology, the access, the call, to email, to text. Um, and when they complete that cycle, when they complete that cycle, the city is going to be there to stand in the gap and offering them opportunities to now build their portfolio. That's great news. And so I'm, I'm excited about the work that we've done. Um, I'll end here. Uh, I've been using this word in, in any lane that I'm speaking, be it on crime and safety, be it with, with kids and education, be it with small jobs. We as leaders in Jacksonville, have st we have to start being intentional. We have to. And so as long as I'm sitting in this seat, I can assure you of this. There are current, currently conversations going on with, with all of our agencies and with our departments of saying, let's be sure that we are setting aside. We do so much work with so many people. Let's make sure that we're setting aside enough work that we can help our small business leaders as well. And I think this legislation is going to be part of a solution to a problem. So, uh, Mr. Green, Eric, Brian, the team, I mean, I couldn't be more honored to have a chance to just come back and share some more updates. And if any of you all have a question, any of you business leaders on the call or you all at leadership, um, my phone never goes off. I'm always here for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. That, that was great. Great news. Um, I think it's news that all of us can use. Um, all of us who are uh, have businesses located within the city of Jacksonville, small businesses, I get calls all the time on what is happening, how is someone going to assist uh, the small businesses in getting a legitimate shot at the piece of the pie. And some of the barriers that uh, Councilman mentioned um, were exactly the issues and concerns that people have. So I wanna thank you again for bringing that information to us. I know we still got a couple of hurdles and some steps to get through, um, but I'm pretty sure that the other council members will see the positive reaction within the community uh, of these initiatives. So I wanna thank you and the committee again for taking that deep dive into the JSAB program and removing some of those barriers 
and also for setting aside and looking at the fact that um, there is a lot of uh, what we do that can be done by our smaller businesses. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All righty. So we're going to keep this moving. Um, one of the highlights uh, of past um, our appreciation days, at least from the feedback that we've got, is the fact that people get a chance to listen to the decision makers and have questions and answers for the decision makers within our agencies. So we're going to bring up our procurement and uh, our small business panel, uh, which has representatives from JEA, JTA, JAA, JPA. I had to get all the P's out the way first. Um, <laughs> and FSCJ, and also, um, Jacksport again, you know, to speak about um, some of the new things that are coming down the pike. Um, there's some exciting information uh, that's coming down the pike and also to, um, to discuss um, different issues that are coming up. So I'm gonna uh, bring the panel up now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Somebody Good morning. Picture Good morning. coming up. So, well, while we have you here, uh, I, I want to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. So uh, I'll call out your name and uh, if you can give a brief introduction, uh, uh, who you are, what you're with and what your responsibilities are. And um, I'll call each of you out so you don't have to worry about when to chime in. So the first person I'm going to go with uh, is Lewis Mitchell. Good morning. I'm Lewis Mitchell. I'm with the Duval County Public Schools Procurement Department. I'm the supervisor of the procurement department, and I'm here to provide any information that um, anyone may seek from the Duval County Public Schools Purchasing Department. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to go with uh, Retta. Retta Rogers. Yes, good morning. My name is Retta Rogers. I'm the manager of procurement services. Not quite sure why I'm not showing up on camera because it's showing my camera is up. Uh, but <clears throat> I'm just happy to be here today. So I'm, I'm manager of procurement services. Thank you. Next up is one of the uh, newer associates um, uh, to her position. And I want to give a hearty welcome to Diana Mason. So from the city of Jacksonville. Good morning. Uh, I'm Diana Mason. I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is very uh, exciting. It was nice to hear uh, the opening remarks from um, the CEO, Eric Green, and the support that's given, as well as the excitement of Councilman Parent uh, Freeman, who has been working very hard uh, along with the committee, uh, Councilwoman Pittman, as well as Councilman Dennis, in uh, getting the bill. Uh, ready and uh, to pass. There's a lot of exciting things here. I am new to my position. I've been here since January the 4th. Uh, I'm not new to procurement as I was in procurement eight years preceding that as the ombudsman. So now I wear a different hat as the JSEB administrator and I am here to um, enhance and promote our uh, JSEB program and we have so many new and exciting things that uh, we're going to be doing that's going to help uh, elevate our small businesses and um, help them grow in, in different ways. So uh, I'm excited about that. So thank you for having me here and um, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you and again welcome. Uh, we also have Brad Cummings. Hey, Brad, I think you might have muted your microphone, so you might want to check that to make sure you're on. Yep, I think I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Good morning, um, everyone, uh, fellow procurement colleagues and small business owners. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Brad Cummings, the Director of Contracts, Procurement, and Inventory for the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. I oversee all aspects of supply chain management for the authority from, you know, the buying through 
inventory receiving and uh, selling the inventory once we're done with it. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you small business owners about uh, some of the opportunities and new things happening at the, the at the JTA. So thank you and good morning. Thank you, thank you. And we also have Randy Rockvist. Can you uh, let us introduce you? Hi, <laughs> my name is Randy Brokvist. I'm the Executive Director of Purchasing at Florida State College here in Jacksonville. And I'm excited, I think this is year two, I've been involved with the group and I'm very excited to be here. And um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share some things with our small businesses today. And last but not least, I think uh, Lynetta, are you on the phone? Are you are you available? Well, it looks like uh, we've been having connection problems. There's one thing about this new uh, world that we are in, and we've all experienced it. Uh, so we're hoping that she'll be able to get on. She represents the uh, airport. So she's with JAA, and they have some exciting programs that they would also uh, like to speak about. So what I'll do is to get things moving, um, we're going to start this out with a, a kind of question and answer session um, in which uh, I will ask the questions as the moderator, and uh, I will then uh, ask for feedback uh, from the panel. And uh, so, is everybody ready? Yes. yes. All right. So the first question, uh, given our move to virtual procurement, what issues or concerns have arisen that could be considered a barrier for small business participation and how have you addressed them? So I, I think I wanna start this question out uh, with Dinah from the city of Jacksonville because they have some new and exciting things going on there. Uh, thank you. Um, as it relates to the barrier of virtual, uh, it's a good thing to continue to communicate, but you know, person to person is always better. Uh, one thing I think that it, it, it doesn't help is so many people, as you stated before, um, don't know how to navigate they don't understand uh, sometimes the nuances of the agency and our procurement codes are all, you know, they're the same, but, you know, we do things differently as it relates to uh, processes and being virtual, that gets in the way of that. It doesn't allow them to necessarily um, come up and be comfortable like they normally would to find out what's going on. So the, the virtual concept is great because it keeps us in touch. However, it does, you know, it could make people feel uh, a little apprehensive when it comes to trying to navigate through the system and, and stuff. Good. I know the city has, uh, has been making the transition. Um, uh, it's been a year now, I think, since you brought up your new system so that people can get involved uh, with the bidding process and uh, move that uh, away uh, to that system, uh, which I think has been a, a whole lot easier. Um, so we appreciate the effort. Um, and uh, uh, I'll ask, uh, Retta, are you still here? Yes, I am. Can you, can you add a little bit to that? Yes. Yes, so uh, we see that technology and the loss of face-to-face -face, uh, personal engagement and networking opportunities, and just like Councilman Freeman said, it's that energy that's in the room. So uh, some, sometimes that's missing. Sometimes we need to have that face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> so what Jackport has done is, uh, in each of our bids that we send out, we provide detailed guidance on all solicitations of how to submit your bid. Uh, the e-builder platform that we actually use to submit our bids, it provides direct tech support for all external users. And then Jacksport's SEB coordinator and our procurement staff, we're readily available to uh, assist uh, vendors 
that are trying to actually get into our system. And actually today we're gonna to have a bonus session where we actually show you how easy it is to get into our system to upload and to submit a bid. Thank you, thank you, Retta. And yes, we are uh, working on making our transition um, a little easier, but as we're moving through um, and this disease that we've had to deal with COVID, as we are making barriers and breaking through, I think we're gonna start seeing some of that face-to-face uh, -face come back uh, gradually. Um, but I think the technology has allowed us to be more efficient and quicker. Um, does anybody else have a comment that they would like to say? Raise your hand and I'll call you. Okay. If not, then we'll, we'll kind of move on to the next question because this falls in line with what we are talking about. What platforms or means have you used to communicate to small and emerging businesses? Um, so how have you um, reached out to your small businesses? Um, we're gonna let JEA take the lead on this one. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rita Scott. I'm the manager of the Jacksonville Small Emerging Business Program and Procurement Performance at JEA. And um, some platforms that we use at JEA um, include, uh, first I want to highlight our JSEP Procurement Summit. For the past three years, um, JEA has hosted a JSEP Procurement Summit. The summit is typically held in August or September. Um, the summit is our platform to communicate to our small businesses all of the JSEP opportunities for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, last year, the, the summit was hosted virtually, um, and we had over 80 participants. We also had two breakout sessions that offered an opportunity for the uh, attendees to participate in a panel discussion, similar to what we're doing here today. And uh, they had the opportunity to network with our facilities and uh, water wastewater groups. Um, the session had a category manager, a senior buyer, um, a JEA project manager, and a prime vendor as part of the camp. And we have a JEA, of course, is our website. Similar to all of the agencies, um, our website has all of our bid opportunities um, listed on the website. We have formal opportunities that are $300,000 or more, or informal opportunities that range from $50,000 to $300,000. Um, also on our link, we have, excuse me, also on our website, we have a link to our upcoming bid opportunities. Um, these opportunities uh, highlight our water wastewater opportunity, water wastewater opportunities. And this document is updated quarterly, but it's out there for people to download and look at at their leisure so they can see some of the future opportunities that are in the pipeline that are forthcoming. Um, one other area I would like to highlight is um, our new system that we're using at JEA, like some of the other agencies, we have a new platform that was launched in September of 2020, and it's called the Zykus Procurement Resourcing and Contract Management Portal. And this platform is a one-stop shop for all of our procurement solicitations and contracts. Um, I am encouraging all of our small businesses to register so that they can view the JEA opportunities listed within the Zykus portal. Um, but it's really a way for us to do business, um, to do business with JEA a little bit easier as you go through the procurement um, process. And um, it's really kind of automated all of our processes that we're currently doing. And it's worked out really well thus far and we're onboarding um, suppliers every day to this system. And um, one more thing that we're doing, on the third Thursday of every month, I do a doing business with JEA session. And this is a workshop that's open to all small businesses, prime businesses, really any business that's interested in doing business with JEA. Um, and it's held on the third Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Um, it's held virtually, it's a webinar, and um, you can find the link on our website. So we're excited um, to do business with our small businesses and we're trying to make it as easy as possible to find the opportunities as well as participate. Good, good, good stuff. Uh, I, I appreciate that information. 
a, a lot of our small businesses uh, need to know um, who you are. I'm one of those people who likes uh, everybody to see who they're talking with and who they're dealing with. And I think it's good that people are getting to see you uh, and put a face uh, with the electronic virtual world um, as we move forward and your programs um, and your outreach uh, is very commendable. Uh, I, I wanna ask that that same question to, to Duval. Um, maybe they can tell us some of the things that they're doing and what platforms they're using uh, to, to connect the small businesses. Yeah, that's good morning, uh, Brian. Yes, what we've done here at Duval County Schools is that we've used Teams, Zoom, um, in-person meeting with CD, CDC guidelines. Our um, manager of the uh, OEO office, Ms. Paula Wright, what she does is she communicates on those <coughs> excuse me, these in-person meetings with small business businesses that our purchasing staff gives her the bids that are coming up saying, we have this bid for a certain, certain project. So she reaches out to her database, those individuals that have um, that specialty, she reaches out to them and let them know that this bid is coming up. We advertise all of our bids on Demandstar. We don't have a platform outside of Demandstar. So every, all of our bids are on Demandstar. We still receive all hard bids. We maintain Whenever someone's coming into the building, have to go through a temperature check to deliver their bids to our offices up, up in the building. So everything is still hard bid. Um, but again, we use Zoom, Teams, in order for them to have that one-on-one -on -one meetings with our OEO staff, which is Paula Wright. Um, this manager, she tries to have these meetings out in the community whenever she can, but for the most part, Zoom, Twitter, and again, all of our bids are advertised on demand star. Great. Uh, um, you, you brought up some interesting points there. And, and um, I'll just kind of put it out there for the rest of the panel um, in regards to the social media aspect and how we're using those uh, platforms to maybe reach some of our um, constituents, some of our smaller businesses who um, have Facebook, who have uh, Instagram, who have LinkedIn. So has anyone else out there been using those platforms? Um, Brian, at JEA, we use those platforms. Um, you know, I use it to help advertise for the JSEP Summit that we had, and um, JEA uses those platforms to advertise, you know, just in general for JEA. So we have a Twitter account, Facebook, um, all of those platforms are certainly utilized to help advertise our business. And I, I know uh, just to give a, a plug for um, our small business and program and Jackson, uh, Jacksport as a whole, we also have a Facebook page uh, that we uh, frequently uh, update. Um, to let people know what's going on in our small business programs. We have a dedicated LinkedIn page called Jack's Procurement on LinkedIn. I hope you're all connected to that. Uh, and we try our best to put all our bids uh, on our website, uh, jacksport.com procurement. Um, and so we uh, have reached out and found that uh, using these platforms um, has at least increased awareness uh, because people, um, no matter what's going on, they, they always seem to get on Facebook or some social media. So uh, if you haven't thought about it, maybe it might be something that you might want to think about um, to uh, have further contact with your small businesses. Well, uh, hey, Brian, this is Brad from the JTA. We also utilize all of our social media, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram to highlight different meetings that we have um, to try to reach as many people as possible, especially with uh, the announcement of our new small business program and the meetings that we've held associated with that. We've definitely utilized social media as much as possible for that. We've also um, during the height of COVID, um, in order to still have site tours of our facilities, we utilized our YouTube channel and filmed pre-recorded site tours so that way we could socially distance and still have people see 
um, what they needed to see in order to bid on our solicitation. So we tried to use as many facets as possible, especially during you know the heightened period of COVID to draw in as many people. And Brian, um, we currently mm -hmm. are under construction because uh, I totally believe in uh, those platforms. A lot of people are driven to those platforms, especially small businesses. LinkedIn is a very good platform uh, to have because I, I go there quite often and um, it's, it's a great platform to, uh, for small business to communicate and connect and to get to know what's going on around Jacksonville. But right now we're not using those platforms. Uh, but we are under construction with all the changes and hopefully in the next few months we will have those platforms up. But we do have information on the website, but we're reconstructing our website as well. So uh, we're under total reconstruction and uh, reconfiguration. So um, give us a few months and, and we'll probably look completely new. So. Well, that's good. One thing, one thing I do know about uh, working with the city in the past is that uh, you're, you're aggressive in some of your options to small businesses owners, such as uh, OSHA requirements and things of that nature, that you uh, are providing training opportunities uh, for a lot of the uh, small businesses to increase their staff competencies. And, and I think things like that are great. I, I also want to feed off, off that question again, because Lewis brought up something that um, uh, I found very interesting, and that is, how do you handle your pre-bids and your bid openings uh, now that we've moved to this uh, to this uh, a new system or the new era that we're living in? Um, how do, how do you do that? How do you collect your bids, um, and, and how do you get around uh, some of the barriers? Good question. What we, what we do actually, again, like I stated, before someone comes into the building, they have to go through um, temperature check downstairs. They come upstairs to deliver our bid to our um, staff at the front desk. We have a shield. Everything is blocked up, shield. Everyone has to wear a mask. Um, Pre-bids. If we uh, have a pre-bid, what we do is make sure, ensure that we have a venue that's large enough where we can space people out six feet apart so they can you know have that distance so that's what we do we still look for a venue that's large enough in order for us to have a uh cdc guidance you know still in place oh good. that's interesting randy yeah. You look like you're right um, yeah i was gonna say we've we've become a little innovative um on the for our biz we receive everything electronically our, our pre-bid conferences are also held online, which um, sounds a little intimidating, but I'll tell you our participation has increased dramatically, um, not only with the pre-bid conferences, because obviously it's people's time is precious, and so it saves them from traveling and what have you. We are also working remotely, um, so, um, but if we do have construction projects, we make sure site visits, um, that you know, everyone is masked and socially distanced and what have you. Um, but we we have found an actual uptick in interest in our um, evaluation, public evaluations, and our, our conferences and what have you um, going virtual. So um, we're, 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 we use WebEx as our platform to um, hold our pre um, pre bid conferences our evaluations and such. Um, we also, back on kind of the database, we use uh, uh, VBS to advertise our public bids um, through the state of Florida. We're a smaller institution than the rest of you all, so we, we look at existing kind of platforms that we can <laughs> utilize um, to get the message out. So we, we really, um, we utilize the VBS predominantly um, for our public bids. Oh, that's great. That's great. Again, uh, Jacksport, uh, Retta, could you want to give a little feeling on how we're doing that? Yes, we actually use GoToMeeting for our uh, bid. Uh, and although, although we use the eBuilder platform, uh, the eBuilder platform is where they would actually submit their bids and upload them. And then we would actually open them on the GoToMeeting. Uh, we advertise on our we advertise through direct emails throughout eBuilder platform. We advertise on our jacksport.com website. 
Uh, we advertise in the financial news in the daily record. And we also, <clears throat> for small businesses, uh, Brian, our FEB coordinator, he reaches out directly to some of those small businesses to remind them that we have a bid that they might be uh, they might be available for. So <clears throat> those are some of the, the ways that we reach out to our small businesses. And I'm going to have to uh, agree with Randy. We have seen an uptick uh, yeah. in the amount of people who are coming to our pre-bid meetings and are submitting bids um, because I, I think um, it's one of those things that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And it seems like, you know, time is so precious for our small businesses that they've actually uh, ha have adapted very well to moving to uh, an electronic meetings, electronic submittals. Uh, and so uh, it, it's been a, a good show for us. I'm telling you, it has definitely increased our small business participation, uh, which to me is the most exciting part. Um, so uh, I, I, I really, this transition has been hard, but it, it, it also uh, has allowed us to touch more people. And also like uh, the fact that Duval is still open for business uh, and uh, that they're actually seeing people because there's going to be, uh, I believe there's going to be a hybrid coming down the line uh, in which we'll all be able to move in and out of all of our systems a whole lot easier and which I think will increase um, our participation from our small businesses. So since that question was a little off, the, the 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 beaten path well not really but um i'll get back to my assigned questions so the third question based on the increased pressure uh to be more inclusive to small and minority businesses what new programs or policies have been put in place to increase these opportunities and so I, i'm gonna start off with uh jta uh, because they have some new and exciting things I, I would like to make sure they get out there. So Brad, it's on you. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. We're very, very excited. In December, we started a brand new local small business enterprise program. Um, it's a two-tiered program, um, depending on gross annual receipts. Um, anyone or any company that's independently owned and operated um, and has gross receipts of $10 million or under can apply and become a part of our local small business program. Um, benefits for that um, for certain contracts, prime contractors um, who are small businesses who receive bid discounts or um, additional points added to the RFP process to encourage more um, awards to local small businesses. We've also created a micro local small business program for, um, again, independently owned and operated for-profit businesses that have um, annual gross receipts of $500,000 and under, and we'll have a sheltered program um, created for projects under a certain dollar amount that will be reserved only for those micro local small businesses. So that way small businesses are competing against similarly sized small businesses. Um, we'll also be doing that with our other small business program as well, um, just to encourage that type of competition. Another really exciting thing that our board has done is they've changed our procurement thresholds. Um, before we did formal procurement, so requests for proposals or bids for everything over $35,000. We know that the time it takes to respond to an RFP and to a bid is really extensive. And for a small business, that's taking a lot of time and effort out of doing work um, in order to get more work. So we want to simplify that process. We've increased those limits so it'll be more quote-based processes. Um, for projects up to $250,000. Um, we're really excited about this type of process to make it easier for you to respond, to make it quicker um, and uh, more accessible. We are also in the process of developing two other new programs that are intended to help small businesses here in Jacksonville. One is a mentor mentee protege program that will be included in a lot of our bigger um, solicitation projects. Um, where local small businesses will have a chance to partner with a larger business as a mentor. Um, we are going to be issuing an RFI um, for this program 
next week. And we're really excited about that. We build our business program based on feedback from the business community here in Jacksonville. And we want to develop this mentor mentee protege program in a very similar manner where your voice is heard, you have a say in helping to dictate what this program looks like and the benefits that can come from it. Um, as well with that, um, we are going to be also developing a new workforce development program um, that is going to be in line with a lot of our new construction and projects. We have 40 infrastructure projects that are shovel ready that we will be issuing over the next 12 or 18 months. And we want to develop a workforce development program to help the even smaller businesses get a, a part of the program. So lots of exciting and new things happening. Again, we're going to issue an RFI. We want your input to make sure that these programs work and that they're designed specifically for this community. So lots and lots of things happening and we're very excited about it. Um, please look for that RFI as well. Um, on March 31st, we're hosting a virtual event for small businesses um, and local small businesses to talk about those 40 new road work and infrastructure projects that we have coming up. So you will be getting an email blast from us um, repeatedly over the next two weeks to try to get you to come to that event. You can also see it posted on our website at jtafla.com. Um, please register. Um, we encourage you to participate. And then again, respond to that RFI. That'll be issued next week because we desperately want your feedback. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, again, we can see JTA is taking a very holistic approach um, to the whole uh, small business arena, not only uh, on, on the economic development side, but on the small business side, but also on the workforce side, so that there are going to be people who are able to be employed by some of these smaller businesses to do the work um, that you guys are are have set up. So uh, I'm really happy to hear about, about that. Now, I, I also know um, that, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Terrence Freeman, um, that the city is uh, kind of revamping their JSAP program. And he spoke a little bit about that. Um, Diana, I know you said you guys are under construction right now as you're redeveloping the process. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yes, um, I'm excited that we are now bringing access to capital back. That was a program that we had uh, when the JSEB program initially was launched back in 2004. Uh, access to capital was there to help the small vendor, uh, not a, as a startup company, but as a start when they are uh, getting contracts. Uh, uh, their contract itself will be collateral. And that will be used because as um, many of you may know about the Access Capital Program, it came into play because most small businesses have a problem with getting funding through traditional banking uh, for different reasons. And you know, traditional banking scores may be a little higher than most can meet, but because um, the at the time Mayor Payton had recognized that there was an issue and we brought a panel together uh, to discuss the access to capital. It was basically there that when a small business gets a contract, a lot of times they don't have the funding to get started or you know to, to, to begin the project. This funding will assist in that. It's a revolving loan program and it's anywhere from six months to a year depending on the size of the loan. Uh, the loan has to make sense. It has to be able to allow the contractor to perform and get the work completed and still have uh, make a profit, but still be able to pay back the loan uh, that it needs. On top of that, we are now uh, having a micro loan program, not micro loan, I'm sorry, excuse me, a micro program. And it's going to help the smaller businesses. As you know, uh, it is required that to be a SASEP, your personal net worth has to be 1.32 million. And now we're going to include a micro program where your personal net worth is going to be up to 300,000. We're going to set aside projects 250,000 and below that only that micro uh, program 
uh, participants can um, can bid on, and the micro program sets in a tier. Uh, our tier program is based on the gross receipt. We have tier one, uh, which is the gross receipt from zero dollars to three million. Tier two is three million to seven million, and tier three is um, seven million to twelve million. This will allow those JSABs that um, Councilman Freeman mentioned. You know, that when we get to a certain point where we're now a big fish, we got to get back into the pond and be a little fish. Basically, the tier will allow them once they reach that person at work to go into the tier program for two years where we will look at personal, we will look at the gross receipts. Um, also, we have an executive program that we're in the process of, of creating and to work with. Uh, educational institute that we will allow have a cohort unit go through uh, and be able to assist them with understanding and uh, managing the front office and their business as a whole and then bring them back through to be able to be prepared to uh, get the contracting with the city. So those are a few of the things that we're we're uh, going to introduce. We're also looking at some point discussing the DBE program. Uh, we do get a lot of federal dollars within the city of Jacksonville. We don't have a DBE program. We need to be able to take advantage of those as well. Um, and so that is just uh, again some of the things that we're doing, but. We have a lot of stuff coming out, and, and once we can get through legislation, I'll be excited to share. We're going to have some events where we're going to be able to discuss all the um, the new uh, nuances of the program, as well as um, you know, to have a strong marketing uh, campaign as well, because we need to grow uh, our program, especially in the areas of professional services. Uh, that's great. Um, I, again, that's why I wanted to make sure I, I, I got, I, I kind of threw that question to you uh, because I, I knew you had some new programs and uh, some old programs that I think you're you're getting ready to rev up to assist our small businesses. And uh, I, I know that um, from speaking with the panel, that everyone is trying to reach smaller businesses uh, to become a part of 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 their network and their uh, goals. And I, and I think that's that's great because there are a lot of people on here who have uh, smaller, smaller businesses, the micro businesses um, that might feel that um, they're too small to uh, contract with any of our entities. And these programs that you're developing uh, will definitely help and assist with that. So I hope you guys are all out there listening uh, because uh, this is some very important information. But don't worry, I'll make sure that you all get information uh, in the next uh, week or so uh, so that you'll have connections to all the panel. Um, and I just want to throw that out there. So if you have any questions, you can uh, put your questions in the chat room. And if we don't get to them today, um, we will definitely um, get those answered for you and send them out to all the people who uh, participated so we all have the information. I forgot to say that at the beginning, um, so please forgive me. But any questions, go to the chat room. I just want to keep moving on because this information is so exciting, and uh, we're, we're getting more and more uh, uh, diverse in, in the agencies that we work with. Um, so uh, I have a question kind of uh, uh, for, for Randy um, and, and also for everybody else because a lot of us have different funding streams that we go through. <laughs> Um, and so I wanted to know, uh, based on these funding streams and the decisions that sometimes have to be made as far as goals or things of that nature, um, what are you doing to uh, help uh, assist small businesses uh, with the monies that you receive? And the reason why I'm throwing it to you, Randy, is because uh, uh, that's, the, that's the one area I'm not too sure of. <laughs> um, with FSCJ and the colleges. So if you yeah. can give some information on how you work with small businesses. Well, um, yes, yeah, so we're a little bit different than it. We're not an agency per se. We're, uh, we have a different designation as far as the state is concerned. And so um, there's 28 of a, a state colleges um, 
that our um, kind of our lead uh, state uh, department is the uh, Department of Education. Obviously, we're an educational institution. Um, currently, right now, um, our largest um, small business participation happens on our facilities and construction side. Um, and we do have on our website the listing of all of our general contractors that are pre-approved. Um, so we do strongly encourage um, folks to take a look at that. Um, those are where um, a, a lot of our um, opportunities are for smaller local businesses um, in regards to facilities and construction. Um, as you know, the economy is a little bit tight, so uh, construction is, we don't have as many projects as Brad has, <laughs> but <laughs> transportation is going to be big, very big now. <laughs> Uh, on the education side, um, we don't have as many construction opportunities. Um, so also, the fact that many of our students are remote learning, um, you know, so um, there's less facilities used right now. But um, we are also working to um, upgrade our, our ERP system on the supplier side so that we're able to really um, communicate better with businesses. Um, right now, it's it's just kind of a, a I would say just a database. Uh, but we're hoping in the next several months, by the end of summer, to have uh, a little bit more robust functionality so that we're able to um, better communicate with our um, local businesses um, for different opportunities. Um, and like I said, we we utilize the state of Florida contract. This is a tip that I would for us I would recommend small businesses look at. Um, uh, we just recently, um, when you think of state of Florida, you think, oh my gosh, it's so big. And, but what they do is for different types of uh, services, they break them up regionally. And so there's opportunities for businesses in Jacksonville to participate on state of Florida contracts. Um, we recently um, awarded a contract to a small business from that we found via the state of Florida for security guard services. So, um, you know, and it, I know it seems a little strange, but um, we've really found um, that all businesses that connect with those larger contracts um, really have um, a lot more exposure to smaller colleges like myself and the other 27 state colleges that are, um, uh, you know, we utilize those uh, contracts. Um, we're asked to actually preview those first before going out to bid. Um, and there's a lot of small businesses um, for all different types of services that I've seen. Uh, so I would strongly recommend um, small businesses, if, it, if they haven't done so, is make sure that they're registered as a vendor through the um, BBS system through the state of Florida. So I highly recommend it. Great. I, I appreciate that information. One thing uh, that, that I feel that makes this uh, panel and that make this uh, seminar so important is that I, I want the community to realize that we're looking at Jacksonville, Duval, and the surrounding areas as a whole. Um, we're not just here to say, oh, I just want people to work for Jacksport or I just want people to work for JTA. We're here for everybody. So there are so many opportunities out there that uh, you guys represent. And I I'm, I'm very happy. Again, I can't explain to you how happy I am that you are all here um, to, to express that. And, and like uh, Randy was bringing out, uh, one of the things that uh, we're excited about here at Jacksport it is the fact that you know we are, as was mentioned earlier, have a $70 million project uh, coming forth in the next year. Well, it's actually being prepared now as we speak, um, that we will have small business participation on it. And I'm excited about the fact that I'll be able to present a lot more opportunities to our smaller businesses um, to participate uh, in Jacksport's um, expansion and renovation. I wanted to ask Lynetta a couple of questions, but unfortunately, I think uh, technically she hasn't been able to get here. So I wanted to put in a plug for uh, the airport, JAA. Um, and that is some of the information that I, I do know is that they have uh, like every second Monday, they have a meeting 
to meet and greet with small businesses um, that are interested in, in speaking with the procurement team and their staff in different areas um, to let them know um, that they're available. Um, they review all their solicitations to see if they can have some SEB, JSEB, BBE, uh, veterans goals, all these things that we look forward to. Every solicitation that comes through there, and, I, and I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for the choir here, is at least reviewed to see how we can have small businesses participate. And so they're uh, uh, very, um, uh, they're one of my go-to people um, when, when I do have some questions because they uh, work with some of the funding uh, along with JTA that we work with that has some limitations. So we have to come up with creative ways to meet um, with our small businesses so that we can um, still uh, secure a piece of that uh, for our small businesses. So I just want to have one more question. I'm kind of just going to open this up because we've hit on it um, as we've been going through. And, uh, and that is, now that the restrictions are from COVID are being uh, eased and lifted up, what plans do you have moving forward for in-person contact and how do you think this transition might look? Again, some of this might be still up in the air, um, but uh, as Lewis said, they're already, they're still doing theirs. Uh, and, and as we move forward, uh, it's just kind of a general discussion. Um, what, what do you think that's going to look like in the future? Lewis? Yeah, right. What we're planning on doing is that through our OEO office, we're going to have community meetings, again, within CDD, CDC guidelines, and we're planning to have two meetings a month starting in April at local venues throughout the city so that we can let the small business community know that we're here to do business. And as uh, Brandy said earlier, um, with the construction, we're going to be doing a lot of construction. And what we do is we try to get the small businesses to, to understand that they they should reach out to some of these larger companies because what we're putting in these RFPs that go out, we're putting in that small business portion that they must be must be given to to the uh, small businesses. So make those contacts. Okay, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> Donna, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yes, um, we at the city are also uh, doing business. Um, we are open. Uh, we are having uh, our general ward committee sessions as well as our professional services uh, committees. They're both by Zoom and in person. Uh, I do uh, plan to have some events uh, Hopefully we will, I'm looking at a larger event after uh, July timeframe. Uh, I'm believing that what I'm understanding rather is that the CDC as well as the president has mentioned that after July, um, we should be in better shape. So therefore we are looking to have something uh, more of a meet and greet uh, to get to know uh, our JSEB to also help with marketing and networking. And so uh, we will put that out as well. We are also creating a um, platform now to help people understand how to do business with the city. We will make that available through uh, social media. Uh, we'll put it on our website as well. But we are planning to begin our meeting greets uh, outside of Zoom. And hopefully, I would say, to be safe, it will be after July. Mm -hmm. Good. Rita, was that you? Put your hand up. That's Rita, but I can comment. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, for Jack, these are, yes, these are no, new glasses. 
<laughs> so right now for Jacksport, we, we haven't made any uh, concrete decisions of what it's going to look like. I think it would be slow and methodical of what we're going to do. Uh, and I think it will more than likely be a hybrid of what we have right now and what we had before. So. And, and uh, thank you. And Rita, I'm pretty sure you want to follow up on that as well. Sure. Thank you, Brian. Um, we would love to have our um, JSA procurement summit this year face to face. Of course, we'll just follow the <clears throat> excuse me the CDC guidelines um, that are in place at that time. Whether or not we can do that face to face, if not, we will continue to have it virtually as we did last year. We also, um, you know, have the monthly doing business with JEA workshop. I will tell you, I've seen an uptick in the participation in that workshop because it's being held virtual. I think it's more convenient for people. Um, they don't have the travel time or they have to worry about parking downtown and that whole travel, you know, transition into getting into the meeting and going through security. It just makes it a lot easier, more convenient for people to sign in where they are to participate in that workshop. So I'll likely continue to have that. Um, virtually via WebEx. And then um, for procurement as a whole, uh, moving forward, it's looking like we're going to continue working from home uh, for the procurement department at JEA. So I think moving forward for us, it's going to be more of a hybrid model. Um, currently, we're doing our bid openings virtually, and they seem to be very successful. And um, we're hosting our awards meetings they're hybrid right now. I foresee that continuing to be a hybrid model. And, um, you know, just moving forward with this, this new norm that we're in, I think it seems to be working. I think we've learned a lot over um, the course of time since March of last year of how to do business virtually and be successful at it. So I think moving forward for JEA, I think you're going to see more of a hybrid approach um, more so than anything. Well, oh, great. Um, uh, and again, I, I appreciate uh, uh, you guys uh, giving that information out as we move forward. But look, hey, I actually got a question on the chat that I want to send out uh, for one of the participants. And it's basically uh, probably for JEA and the city. Um, under the new JSEB ordinance, will JEA follow the same guidelines? Um, so if the overall goal for each department is 20% or more, Will JEA uh, follow the the, the uh, criteria for the city? So, as you know, JEA participates in the JSA program that's led by the city. And of course, when those new guidelines come out, we will certainly review those in detail and figure out how we're going to incorporate that into the JEA model. So, once we know of all of the details of the the new JSA program, we certainly will figure out how we're going to incorporate it into our program. And and I'll just throw my two cents in there uh, because we are uh, a large proponent, uh, a, a large user of the JSAP program. Um, and I will just pretty much say ditto your comments uh, because we will be reviewing them um, and to make sure that, um, you know, that we're, we're staying up to date and current. Uh, I have one more question and I think that's going to be it. Um, one main challenge uh, in running a small business is balancing resources between pursuing work and performing work. RFQ proposals can be significant effort to produce. Is there consideration for a streamlined proposal template for small businesses who are already registered as a vendor? Any takers? I'm going to ask you to repeat that again, Brian. The gist of it is, um, where is there consideration for a streamlined proposal template for our small businesses who are already registered as a vendor? And so that's kind of the gist of the question. Well, as it relates to proposals, um, and submission, we do follow state statute and we follow guidelines that are within our procurement code. 
So, and you know, each agency as well have different guidelines relating to proposals. Your proposal really follows basically your, your, the RFP and the description of services. I don't know how that could be streamlined outside of uh, what is required uh, because the, the agency that's looking for the proposer is looking for specific information um, to know that they are the responsible, responsive bidder. Uh, therefore, um, a, a question I, I don't know how to answer necessarily for streamlining, but just to make sure that there's an understanding that it's being followed by specific policies, procedures, as well as state statute. Good, and I, I think uh, the gist of it is, I think uh, as, as in closing, I think it was Brad and a, and a couple of others who um, whose boards have risen some of the uh, thresholds for uh, RFPs and for formal and informal bids. Um, as we move forward, we might see uh, less uh, formal RFPs and more informal, uh, which will then can streamline the process. Um, but each of us does have our thresholds um, that we use um, that are in our charters and our guidelines, and they're all being reviewed um, to see ways um, that we can uh, make it a little uh, easier for smaller businesses to uh, respond. Um, so I want to thank all my panel uh, for all your assistance and all your information. Um, it's, it's important that we get this information out there so that people know how to get in touch with us. And, and to my audience, I want to say, make sure that you look at these names, Lewis Mitchum, Rita, <laughs> Retta, <laughs> Ina, Brad, <laughs> Randy. Make sure you, 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 you mark those names down. Um, we'll be sending out some information for contact information, but their contact information is readily available on each of their websites. So um, again, I want to thank my panel uh for uh, participating and i want to thank the uh audience for a couple of questions that were sent to me and i hope we answer some of those questions if you have more keep writing them down and we'll try and get back to you so with that i'm going to salute my panel and say thank you again thank you great job thank brian you. all thank right you. Well, thank you brian See you guys around. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move a little forward. And uh, again, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we do this year is that we connect with entities that some of us um, uh, might take for granted or may not have uh, been able to uh, work with or seen the benefit. So I'm going into my chamber spotlight section. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about some of the chambers around Jacksonville um, that, that are here for us. The first one I'm going to talk to you about is the Indo-U.S. Chamber of Commerce for Northeast Florida. And it's their mission is to provide active networking forum uh, for Indian American professionals, business owners, and organizations in Northeast Florida who can advance their interests by exchanging ideals, promoting professionalism through education and community involvement. Their vision is to create a vibrant growth for and facilitate access to Indian American businesses and professionals. You can email the chamber at info at indousnefl.core.org, which is Indo US Northeast Florida abbreviated. The next chamber is the First Coast Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and they are the premier Hispanic chamber. Uh, their mission statement is to positively, in fact, the regional economy 
by creating value, promoting and facilitating in the success of Hispanic owned businesses and by engaging the community at large. Their vision is to be recognized as the premier Hispanic chamber of Northeast Florida for building successful partnerships that encourage business growth. And their email is fcgcc at fchcc.com. Uh, again, this information is going to be available. And uh, so there you have it for them. I appreciate them being a part of us. Now I'm going to get to some of the newer chambers uh, that are emerging uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, and this one is the Jacksonville Veterans Chamber of Commerce. I think this one is very important uh, for you to connect to uh, because we have a lot of veterans. I mean, we have two naval bases. What more can you ask for? So this chamber uh, is a nonprofit and it's affiliated chamber under United States Veterans Chamber of Commerce. The mission is to holistically enrich the lives of transitioning military veterans and their families and work across a wide spectrum of needs. They are in collaboration with community partners for the betterment of the veteran community by building a strong local community representing the interests with business with government, enhancing economic opportunities, making changes through advocacy, increasing stability, and providing network and education opportunities for veterans. They say we are here to serve <clears throat> our veteran business owners and their uh, families by creating opportunities through advocacy and economic prosperity. Uh, you can find out more about them uh, at membership at jaxvcc.org and their website is www.jaxvcc.org. Um, so reach out to them um, uh, because again, they're here for you. And the last and final one that I wanna spotlight today uh, is a brand new one. And it is the Greater First Coast Chamber of Commerce and Innovation and Trade. And their mission is to create opportunities for economic and social prosperity, transformation and growth of the Greater First Coast community and business core. Their program is to focus on their vision to serve the foundation of six pillars of supporting and uplifting black owned businesses and their allies. These pillars are access to capital, business opp to business opportunities, innovation and investment, global trade, entrepreneurial training and development and job creation. They want to be the first source of organization of commerce and business development for partnership opportunities and advocacy in the First Coast community. Their email is greaterfirstcoastchamber at gmail.com. And they also do weekly broadcasts um, on Facebook. So you can look at their Facebook page uh, to find out when they'll be highlighting small businesses as they move forward. I think it's important that um, we understand and recognize that the local chambers in which we'll have Jack's chamber on a little later, they're here to provide you the latest and most update information on small businesses and the economy. So anything that you need to know, um, they should be one of the first people you go to. Consider joining uh, one of your chambers um, to assist them in the growth and development of um, our city. So it's important that you understand that they have programs as well um, that will help put you in a better position to present your business. Um, and we'll go on into that a little bit later, but I just wanted to make sure that um, everybody had a chance to look at um, and see something new this time around uh, and to realize that you know as much information as you can get is what you need to get um, you will find out about all the latest government programs all the latest uh COVID relief programs and just different things that are happening in the city that if you have the knowledge beforehand 
you'll be able to uh, increase your opportunities and increase your chance of participating. And and they're they're chock full of programs. So look up your local chambers. I, I think again, again, it's my personal opinion that they are very important in assisting you develop your business. So that's my chamber spotlight for today. And so um, we're going to move forward with our program. Um, I almost sound like felt like I was doing a commercial brought to you by. Um, so <laughs> we're going to move forward now with uh, following on that theme of getting to know, uh, getting the information. Uh, I'm going to bring up two people who um, have assisted me from the time I've come to Jacksonville. And one of them is Julie Graham, and she is the first vice president of Citizens Bank. Um, but Julie and I go back to when I first came to Jacksonville, um, in which she was a major uh, uh, partner with a program, I'm going to plug it, Knots for Kids, um, which was a youth program working with uh, young people here in uh, Jacksonville. So I've known Judy, Julie for a while. And I watched her grow in her field, um, and I'm so proud of her. And I'm glad that she um, is taking a part in our session today. And then we also have what I call the man at SBA, Thaddeus Hammonds. Um, he's, if you need to know anything about small business, women's advocacy, um, the 8 8 program, this is the man you need to know. Um, Again, without any further ado, I am going to allow you two to um, come up on the screen now and just say a little bit about yourself, and then we'll kind of talk about uh, what, we, what we're here to talk about, um, COVID relief as one of the things for small businesses. All right, Julie? Sure. Thank you for having me, Brian. Um, I've been in banking for 15 years. I, um, we specialize in the small business and middle market business segmentation here at First Citizens. Um, that's the bank that um, I work for, First Citizens Bank. Um, you may not have seen or heard of us because we're not a big like consumer bank where we've got our sign everywhere. We do have four uh, branches in Jacksonville and we have a, a, a very extensive reach though within the business community. Um, so, as Brian said, I've been involved in a lot of different organizations and grown my career over the last 15 years. I've done the consumer side, small business side, and now kind of graduated into the more middle market segmentation at a bank that specializes within that space. I am a native of Jacksonville. I graduated from UNF, so Osprey Swoop. <laughs> and then um, I have worked with a lot of um, the different programs and individuals involved today um, with the SBDC, the SBA. Um, we're a preferred lender with SBA. Um, you know, my parents um, have a, a project in South Africa, um, and that's their mission, and I truly feel banking is my mission and providing financial education, which, you know, you don't get in school and you don't um, get provided to you as a business owner when you um, enter into business. So that's what I love to do and, and help others, um, whether it's referring them to someone who can help them or if it's a tool that we have. Um, First Citizens allows me to have a vehicle to make an impact in our community here, and I'm excited to continue to do that by speaking to you all today and sharing the information that, you know, I have that I think will be helpful. Well, thank you, Brian. First of all, on behalf of our district director, uh, Malcolm Richards, for having us here today at the um, third annual um, Small Emerging Business Appreciation Day. Uh, it is great. What a wonderful morning so far. I mean, from Councilman um, um, uh, Terrence, um, oh gosh, I apologize, but uh, the Councilman's remarks about the changes on the City Council and uh, how it's going to impact the JCF program. Uh, we work with a lot of JCF vendors at this point in time. Um, I am fortunate to have a number of wonderful colleagues in our district office. Yes, um, you know, we we provide support to small businesses uh, in terms of helping them start, uh, grow, expand and recover after disaster. Um, but, you know, we, we have a lender relations division, our government contracting division where the 8A folks are and the women on small business folks are uh, economic development division. And uh, and so we're just happy to be here today to talk about uh, one of the programs 
uh, that's been really impactful to a lot of small businesses, and that's the Paycheck Protection Program and our Targeted Isle Advance Program. So um, looking forward to the discussion. And um, uh, again, a great day. And the last panel, I just want to say, um, you know, we work with a lot of the uh, agencies here around Jacksonville. And a lot of the comments they made about the, the use of technology and some of the programs that are coming online, uh, we look forward to working with you all uh, in the future as you um, uh, go forward. So, so I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you both. So uh, I'm pretty much gonna give you guys the floor. I just wanna uh, give you uh, 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 the show to let you know that um, we are interested in the information on getting to know you, uh, getting to know why it's important that people know you or someone like you um, as we move forward when it comes to a lot of the government programs that are coming down the pipe. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out of the picture and give you guys the floor and uh, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'll start um, just by jumping into the PPP program, you know, how banks were involved, just to give you guys some information um, that a lot of you may not realize or a lot of the people that you work with didn't realize what was going on. It was fast and furious. The government was trying to get it out as soon as possible to get money to our businesses that needed it. Um, so it wasn't, you know, maybe the smoothest process you've had with your banker um, in the time that you've known them. But it was because, you know, it, it was trying to be rolled out and kind of evolving as we got the information as the government was trying to do the best they could to, um, to give it to us. So what they did was they, they um, passed the legislation and then, you know, realized the SBA does not have the capacity to take on this amount of financing and within the website and the portals. So they asked the banks to help. They um, uh, reached out to the banks and, you know, how can we make this work and have you guys involved from the front end to underwrite it, to um, take intake the information needed to see if um, the business qualifies. So there was a lot of back and forth with that to make it happen because we had to use our capital. It wasn't the government's capital at first, it's ours. And then, you know, we get it back when it's forgiven. So there was a lot of um, discussion through that process. Then, you know, what happens is the bank has to implement that new product per se and that process within their you know technology they had to um, figure out how are we going to do this so some of you might have had a link that your banker directed you to hey go to your website to apply some of you were put on a 1-800 number where they had a department that was just doing that intake one thing about first citizens that we did really well is we were informed and educated on the program we also were proactive in teaming up through the application process to collect information that we anticipated from what the phone information we did have, even though we didn't have everything, what would be needed at forgiveness. So then that way we wouldn't have any issues when it came time to be forgiven. The other thing we did is we're one of the few banks, you know, from the feedback I've heard from my peers is we proactively reached out to clients and said, hey, you know, we're, we're going to um, roll this out. You know, I want to see, are you going to be, you know, trying to take the, take take out the PPP, um, we wanna be here for you. And we, we handheld them through the process. We had experts that you know, viewed the package before we submitted it to our own internal underwriting to make sure that everything was there. And if something was missing, we could come back to you first before we submitted it to the SBA um, portal. We did have to go through the SBA to get approval for it. It's the SBA program. That's different than the EIDL where you actually went through the SBA site. In a perfect world, you know, you might have been able to do both in that SBA site, but it's just, you know, the SBA didn't have the capacity. There's a lot of money that was given out, you know, truly impactful to businesses. Um, you know, it, 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 we have some clients, you know, that have several hundred thousand dollars a month in payroll. That's a lot of money, right? And it was there for everybody to stimulate the economy. Now, one thing I'll point out is I did have a lot of former clients from past institutions, people that I know that reached out to me. They couldn't get a hold of anybody. Some banks, you know, handled it better than others. Um, where bankers went MIA, you know, they weren't returning calls, people were calling me, and a lot of banks, you know, we helped our clients, we've got to make sure we take care of our clients first, right, I give them our, you know, they have the relationship with us, you know, they've um, been with us and we've been with them, you know, I'm, I say I'm married to my clients, you know, when you're at the business level, I talk to them on a regular basis, so we're going to look out for them first, I did respond and help my friends try to give them guidance, try to reach out to a contact that I have at that other bank, but sometimes they, they weren't even provide information. They rolled it out later, you know, so then, you know, that timing was so important. 
I think the biggest thing too is the, the relief of fear, right? That there's all this information out there. The news was saying stuff. Oh, it's going to roll out at 12 midnight. Like, how is that going to happen? The banks have to implement it in their technology. Like, don't listen to the news. Like, you know, being able to talk through somebody. Hey, you know, we're all banks are in the same boat. We're going to release it, you know, very similarly. Um, you know, reach out to your banker to, to, to give you information. I think that quiet period of two weeks was scary for a lot of people. Businesses needing to make quick decisions. Do I need to lay people off? Like, you know, there's so much um, ripples that happen from, you know, am I going to get these funds or not? And it's so important to have somebody to talk you through that and to, to do it right. You know, we're going to see some of this hairiness come down to forgiveness. We've seen some of the fraud that happened that didn't have that front end process. Um, to help vet these um, these applications, right, and these these businesses to help them. So I'm really proud of the, of the way First Citizens handled it. And um, one one other thing I want to mention, you know, the, why, why is that? Why is that? Some banks did it this way, some banks did it that way. Not all banks are the same. You know, it's just like not all restaurants are the same. Different banks have different focuses. So um, you know, I've worked for other banks that did everything from you know check cashing for non-clients and prepaid cards and help establish credit. You know, up till now, where we, we really specialize in that business segmentation, where we don't have a lot of the noise of other things, and we're able to pivot and adjust. So we're designed to implement something quick like this. This is for our narrow focus that we have. This is a priority. We can be nimble. Um, so just to kind of elaborate on that, because this is, I think, important, too, with Brian mentioned of who, who is your teammate as a banker? You need a banker on your team. You need your SBA representative, which we have Thaddeus here too, because that's, that's, that's actually what I did to a lot of people that weren't my client, was I, I, I got them in touch with the SBA contract to help walk them through it, right? And I tried to help, but again, my clients are my priority. My phone was blowing up too with my clients. I've got to make sure I get them in. So I did the best I could. But um, to Brian's point, like your banker is your partner. You want to you be a priority to them, right? So um, you know, having the SBA contact, you know, an attorney, you know, that specializes in making sure your, your business is established in the right way, your legal entities, should something come up, do you need, you know, non-competes with for your employees, all those kinds of things that can rear its ugly head down the, down the line and have, you know, made businesses, you know, send them to the graveyard, so to speak. And then, you know, you also want a great CPA. CPAs were so important in this process. And that's another thing, too, when you walk into a bank that they don't specialize in you know, business finance, or you're, you're dealing with like a branch representative who knows a little bit about business, but they don't specialize in that, they might not have those circles of, um, you know, resources for you, where we work with them all the time. We bank them, um, you know, we refer back and forth, we collaborate together. So, you know, if I pick up the phone and call a CPA for somebody and say, hey, I need you to take their call, you know, because they're being inundated with a lot of questions. You know, they're going to probably take it a little more than some rent, you know, if, if I just hand it off, if they try to get a hold of them. They don't, they don't know you, unfortunately. The relationship's not there. They're trying to prioritize as well. So, again, having those people that have already, you know, built those relationships, that they can make a quick call, get access, you know, that, you know, know a CPA that's very responsive, that wants to help, you know, is, is so pivotal. And this is such a, 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 a telling story of that a scenario where, you know, it can make or break a business, and it did. You know, so um, again, we were able to do it the right way and take care of our clients. And some, there is some other great banks that were too. You know, the other thing that some some clients um, or some businesses ran into is, you know, finding out the difference between credit unions and banks. So there's a big difference. You know, credit unions have their place; they have their area of um, specialty, and they do amazing things. Um, I have a, Kamal Gasper is a great friend of mine who does amazing things. We we talk a lot about, you know, it might be a better fit for this person to be at a credit union. Um, where they specialize in different things, but they can't do certain things that the bank does. Like, again, they weren't partnered with the SBA. They came up with their own program that was great, that they could offer, like, a smaller amount and things like that. But, you know, that's not that's a drop in the bucket compared to what the PPP program was if you've got, a, you know, an extensive payroll, right? So, um, you know, credit unions have their place. You know, banks have their place. You've got um, banks that are going through a lot of transition right now. There's a lot of disruption in the market. If you're a client of banks, you're probably seeing that where your bank is getting bought or you're just seeing branch closures and just a lot of movement that's creating um, an environment where you might have lost your banker. They're no longer there, right? So who do you call or the way their process is changing? What's going on is the middle market segmentation, and that's like your, you know, um, small business to, you know, maybe up to like, you know, 25 million in revenue is, is kind of getting neglected. Um, a lot of the big banks are doing away with that segmentation to have actual relationship managers within that, um, that, that window where you have to be in that high upper level corporate segmentation or they're focusing also on consumer, right? You walk into a branch, typically there's somebody there who can help you with a consumer need, like a 
personal checking account, you know, a, a mortgage, they can they have a mortgage lender, that kind of space. But there's this middle market segmentation that banks are, are continuing to move away from and go into those two separate brackets. So that's where a bank like ours, we specialize within that space. There's things we're doing that other banks are not. Um, I'll give you an example, a previous institution I was at, we didn't like you know, buyouts, like if a CPA wants to buy out another firm or a physician, we just, we just didn't really do buy sales. We didn't like them, we, you know, we, we just didn't do them. Here we love them. You know, I had to say no to so many clients and I thought maybe that's the market called around where we're really good at them, we love them, we understand them, you know, we can get, dive deep into them. Um, but another example too is we have our segmentation as well. So once it's a little bit upstream, you know, there's, there's higher revenue within a space, you know, maybe about 100 million that's in participation banking. There's other banks that, that'll do that better than us. And then a, another example I'll give you, like if we have, we don't do floor planning. That's something dealerships need, you know, so I've, I've been asked about that. And, you know, I, I, I know banks that do do that. And uh, dealerships typically need floor planning. So we might have to meet another need, but not that one. So just having a knowledgeable banker where you know that if you're getting a no, it's a true no like either the banks aren't doing this type of financing or they have a resource, they know who's doing it. I can't tell you how many people come to me and they get a no from somewhere else where they didn't know, like there's an SBA 504 program where you put 10% down, you don't have to put 20%. You don't have to have just a 10 year term on commercial real estate. You can go to 25 years, but does your banker know about the SBA programs that are out there? I can speak from working in a retail branch where I dealt with businesses where I was not trained on that um, in depth. I kind of found it out on my own um, and then just through conversations of you know what, what all is out there just because again as, as an industry we, we've kind of neglected that space as a whole with um, the exception in my experience of you know what we're doing at First Citizens. And then two other points I'll make just again about what's different here. This is why I work here. I love the middle market segmentation. I'm passionate about it. I'm fans of my business owner clients that, you know, I, I love their products and I know about them. I'm kind of their fan and then I meet them and now I thank them. And it's just really exciting that I get to help them and be their partner. But we're a partially privatized institution. So some of you understand the you know, economy at a macro level. You know, every bank that you go to, their um, you know, model has return to shareholders, right? So, um, you know, we're a little bit different in that, you know, the family that started us back in 1898, they still have majority control over us. So we're kind of in, in the same shoes as you, where you own your business, you know, of the family owns our bank. You know, we're a very flat organization. So to get things done, it's, again, how we were able to just pivot with this um, PPP program. Like, I make a phone call. You know, I'm three away from the C CFO. You know, we, we have local decision in here. You know, we can really vet deals for our clients, have some say you know, get things done very quick on the front end so we're not taking you through a whole process that's wasting your time um, um, because of how we're um, made up. Now, we are growing, so we've grown since um, 1898 through times like this where other banks struggle, but we um, have a unique degree of autonomy because of how, you know, we're designed where we actually just merged with CIT Group this last year, even with everything that's going on and almost doubled in size. So we've specialized in professional industries um, over the last hundred years, but now we're getting into more manufacturing um, and commercial industrial um, type industries. And that's um, a final point I want to make is some banks specialize in certain industries. So understanding your NAICS code, how that impacts you, you need to make sure that's accurate. There's different industries coded um, as higher risk when it comes to lending if you need financing. So understanding and making sure that you have the proper code when you file your tax returns and your banker's putting that in. Again, some people, if you're walking into a branch, aren't trained as much and they'll just search the first term and that'll impact whether you can get uh, financing or not. I'll give you two exa quick examples. So I had a client that was a construction attorney. They did construction litigation. However it was set up, they just searched construction and the NAICS code was wrong. Great client, put in the line of credit request and then Again, nobody really looked at it. The default for the code turned it down because it was a higher risk industry, what, what it had coded. It took me three weeks to get it turned around. So, you know, that wasn't fun, but, um, you know, got it done. But um, again, that was at another institution where there's so many layers to get things done. Um, and then another example is um, uh, like, if, if print, like printing, publishing versus advertising. I see that a lot where you know, they've got it coded wrong, printing and publishing, we know paper's kind of going away. Um, that's a more at-risk industry. 
Um, you've got um, advertising agencies and marketing firms, they're doing their own printing, so there's a lot of competition. So, you know, you know, we're going to look at that when we, we consider lending, whereas maybe you don't do any of that, you know, but if your banker doesn't know when they're putting in those figures while you're talking to them and they're, they're helping you, um, it can make an impact and uh, a difference of whether you're able to, you know, have a commercial real estate loan and not pay your pay rent, get a lot of credit to help you meet this, this gap that we have right now maybe in your revenue, um, and just, just have the conversation. So those are just a couple of tidbits of things I've learned over my career that I wish I would have known, you know, way back in the day um, when I was starting to help small businesses. Um, there's a lot of solutions out there. There is good bankers out there. Um, I just encourage you to use me as a resource. Um, thank you, Brian, for, you know, putting all this information out there. I use a lot of um, uh, these people <laughs> for questions. And, um, you know, when I have something come up that, you know, I don't know the answer to that's more um, a program that they'll need, um, I try to tap into them, and, and you guys all, you know, help make me better. So I appreciate that, and, and I just like to do the same. So, um, you know, Brian can give you guys my contact information if you want to take down my email. It's Julie, J-U-L-I-E, dot Graham, like the cracker, um, at firstcitizens.com. And I'd be happy if you're a business owner just to answer questions, um, you know, if, if you have questions about, you know, what's going on with the release programs, um, of the forgiveness process, I can maybe direct you in the right direction. If you don't have a contact or your bank, I may know somebody. Um, we kind of, you know, keep in touch in case we need each other and, and help each other share information. Um, so um, just, just feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. A lot of great information, Julie, um, and uh, something you said over and over again, which makes a lot of sense and something we tell our uh, clients and customers all the time relationships relationships matter and start with your bank your financial institution is where it all happens a lot of people call the sba and they say um i'm interested in the ppp and what should i do well you got to go to the bank the sba does not approve nor do we disperse loans or loan proceeds so um uh, she's she's spot on uh, a lot of wonderful comments hope you all were taking notes um, and, and that's a lot of detail that people miss. Uh, another comment she made was about a CPA. A lot of people have an accountant or a CPA on, on board and they are very helpful in ensuring that all the information and documentation that these banks need, that you have, the, that you have, you know, your financials are intact, your taxes are intact. So that once you go and make that request um, and you complete the application, you are pretty much taken care of. So um, uh, great, great information. Wonderful. So I just want I pulled up um, some information on the PPP. I got some numbers. I want to share with you some of the numbers and then I'm just going to uh, spend a couple of minutes and kind of walk through the first draw PPP loan, second draw PPP loan and, and targeted idle uh, advance, if you don't mind. So so to date um, for 2020 and 2021, uh, we've spent about seven we've um, actually processed or approved over 8.1 million PPP loans, um, over $712 billion. Uh, that's a lot of work in 5,400. Remember this number, over 5,400 financial institutions helping us out because the SBA, all the SBA does is guarantee the loan. We have a 100% guarantee on these loans versus the 7A or 504 loans where it's 75 and 85%. Uh, based on the amount of the loan. So, but that, those are big numbers. And so, but this iteration here, the, um, since um, the start of 2021, we've approved about 2.9 million of those loans for about $190.5 billion. Um, the, again, a lot of activity, a lot of support, and we really appreciate our banking community, our uh, participating lending uh, partners who are out there like Julie and, and the other institutions that help us out. And, and then I want to uh, show you or talk about some of the um, um, first and second draw loans to um, our low to moderate income communities. And, um, and so, but it's interesting in that there are over 242,000 loans approved in the low to moderate income communities for over $12 billion. The average loan amount is $53,000 in those communities. Um, in Florida, there were over 111,000 of those loans approved for low to moderate income communities and over $6.9 billion dispersed. 
um, uh, to those communities. And so again, you know, the SBA and, um, and our partners are doing all we can to help um, those hardest hit um, across the spectrum of, of these um, entities that we support. Um, and so that being said, um, I'm just gonna walk through first draw, take a couple of minutes and then the second draw, um, some loan forgiveness and targeted idle advance. As you all know, um, the PPP program will end on March 31st, 2021, unless the, either the program's extended or all funds are exhausted for the program. So um, at this point in time, it seems like we'll be able to make it. Um, I, I can't stress enough the importance of going to your bank where you have a relationship and um, expressing to them your desire to uh, apply for a PPP loan. Now, it is getting extremely late in the game because most people like Julie, they are inundated as it is. So a lot of, of our financial institutions we found last time around, you know, that last week of PPP, they were, you know, they had all these loans in the queue that they had to process. So the, a lot of banks cut off applications maybe a week or five days before the deadline. So I'm not saying that's the case now. I'm just saying, be prepared in case you go late. Um, and I would call right now, if you haven't applied already, I would call someone and or your bank, right? And then uh, let them know you're interested in the PPP loan because once it's over, it's over. So um, the same allocation exists um, for the uh, loan forgiveness as it was last time, you know, that, that means once you receive one of these PPP loans in order to uh, have forgiveness, 60% um, of the proceeds must be used on um, payroll costs and 40% on non-payroll costs. Um, you know, you can use these loans for, like the last time, mortgage interest. You can use it for rent, utility costs. And now they've added some costs, right? So let's say you've got some covered operations expenditures. Um, um, so you wanted to invest in some cloud computing or some software or some tracking software for HR or um, inventory or things of that nature. Well, those things are now covered under the, um, <laughs> excuse me, non-payroll costs. If, um, if you receive property damage due to civil unrest, last summer there was a lot of civil unrest. So if you're in an area where there was a lot of civil unrest and your business was affected and uh, are damaged, and you didn't have uh, uh, insurance costs to cover it, then you can recoup those, uh, add those costs as non-payroll costs under this new iteration of the program. Um, there's certain supplier costs. So uh, let's say you had something like a, a purchase order or a contract in place prior to the covered period and um, there was a loss, you can recoup those losses uh, again on this program. And finally, if you, um, have some sort of, um, um, what do we call it, um, uh, supplier costs uh, for covered operations expenditures, such as um, PPE, um, say you had to build a drive-through or drive uh, or some sort of um, um, plexiglass dividers, uh, you had to purchase all the stickers and you know be compliant with all of the CDC, OSHA, and HHS guidelines, as well as the state and local uh, uh, and the state and local guidelines for um, the COVID-19 pandemic. You can recoup those costs as well. So, <laughs> excuse me, um, that's important. So the program's still the same. Um, you know, as long as you have 500 employees or less, this is for the first draw. 500 employees or less, you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, uh, you can be a, a church, uh, any nonprofit, 501c3 or, or, you know, a veterans organization, C19, but there are some new entities that are allowed to participate this time out, and those include 501c6, it's like chamber organizations, uh, housing cooperative, destination marketing uh, organizations, um, and any eligible news organizations, so um, that's important. So, um, you know, again, and if you are a, um, um, an industry in the NAICS code, um, you know, Julie mentioned NAICS codes, uh, NAICS code 72,000, accommodation and food services, 
uh, with more than one physical location, uh, you can employ less than 500 people per location and still be approved. But remember, again, um, it's important to note, March 31st, 2021 is when the program in or until funds have been exhausted. So um, um, PPP, um, let's talk about the um, second draw PPP loan. And uh, again, in order to qualify for the second draw PPP loan, you must, of course, first have a first draw PPP loan. Um, and you must use that first draw PPP loan. You've got to request forgiveness for that PPP loan. Um, there's about $25 billion set aside for second draw loans for eligible um, businesses with a maximum of 10 employees. And so that's kind of targeting those um, low to moderate income areas and people who um, aren't large companies, right, but uh, small in nature, and say, um, you know, they need a loan of $250,000 or less. Um, if you're eligible and you live in a low to moderate income neighborhood, then th we've set aside $25 billion for you. Um, again, the allocation for um, um, payroll to non-payroll costs are the same, first and second draw. And um, as long as you're eligible, you indeed can, can request forgiveness or apply. Now, one of the areas you, um, you've got to um, go in terms of application is um, www.sba.gov forward slash um, PPP. And you can find all the information on our first and second draw loans um, over there. If you um, if you are interested, there are several loan applications. There is a um, uh, SBA form 2483 and then 2483C, which is the application for those um, Schedule C holders. Remember, the first time out, a lot of people weren't eligible for the PPP loan because they looked at line 31 on the Schedule C, the IRS Form 1040, Schedule C, line 31, looked at net profits and, and they weren't eligible because it was a zero or negative number. Well, what the um, uh, the good folks uh, came together and did was found out, hey, if we take took a look at the gross profits, the gross margins on line seven of the 1040, we could qualify a lot more people and that's what happened. And so, um, uh, so as long as you um, submit the SBA form 2483C, then that's the form for those Schedule C holders. Now, and Julie will tell you this too, um, the bank that you go to may not accept that particular form or those forms, right? They may have an equivalent equivalent form or they may have a platform already set up for you to, um, to uh, make your application. Another point, if you have gone to say First Citizens to apply for your first draw PPP loan, I will go back to First Citizens for my second draw PPP loan. Why? They have all your information. All of your information is right there. They, you don't have to bring anything uh, in addition to what you've already uh, brought to them. So instead of you going shopping, you know, all around the, the, the world for someone else because you couldn't get a hold of Julie on, on Monday, because she was busy and couldn't get back to you until Tuesday or Wednesday. Now you've caught up, you caught yourself in a situation where you may have two or three loans out there and you don't know which way is up. And then you're going to call us and say, hey, I, I made an application, but I don't know where my loan is. Who's this person? In? So be patient. Go back to the bank that you originally went to. It's very important. Um, so again, if, if you are applying for the second draw people, PPP loan, um, and uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, you have less than 300 employees, um, and as long as you can show where you um, had a 25% reduction in gross receipts uh, over comparable quarters from 2019 and 2020, what that means is you got to compare uh, Q3 2019 to Q3 2020 and show a 25% production. So if you had 100K in Q3 of 2019 and 50K in two th uh, Q3 of 2020, you show a 50% reduction. So you're, you're qualified in that regard. You have more than a 25% reduction over comparable quarters. And, and that's important because um, 
um, again, uh, that allows you to um, to make the application, and the application you would use would be the 2483 SD second draw, and or the 2483 SDC. And again, uh, when you go to your financial institution, they may not accept the SVA's form. They may use their equivalent form or the platform that they've already established for the PPP program. Um, if you are, let's say, um, trying to calculate exactly you know, what the maximum loan amount uh, is for your PPP loan, um, again, uh, what we do is we take a look at, take a 12 month average of payroll costs and we divide that by 12 and multiply that times 2.5 and that's your maximum amount. So, so we'll look at whatever your average payroll cost is, we'll give you two and a half months time um, that amount, and that's the maximum amount, unless you're in the accommodation of food services sector, NAICS code 72,000, NAICS, by the way, is North American classification, in, uh, North American Industry Classification System code. If that code is a 72,000 series, then we'll multiply that times 3.5. So uh, again, uh, because these you know, restaurants and the like were hit harder than anyone else, um, the folks who, um, uh, came up with the with the calculations felt like it was important to 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 help them out as much as possible so so they um they certainly get a leg up hey Thaddeus now for the uh, yes hey uh we're running a little tight on time and uh okay I know you have a lot more information to to give so I'm hoping that people have taken the time out to um uh, get the information from you and Julie, uh, because it's very important. And what I realize is uh, maybe next time when I have to give you guys a little more time uh, because you have a, a lot of information. But I, I, Thaddeus, I hope you didn't leave because I do have one question. No, 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 from no, the I, <laughs> okay, no, I have I one leave. question from the audience, and this is it's kind of for both of you guys. Um, what recommendation does the SBA representative have for small businesses that qualify for PPP funding but have been rejected and the SBA lender is not responding and will not explain the reason? So how can they uh, find out what it was, I guess, that, that was the reason for their rejection? Well, Brian, that's a Julie question because we those those questions have to go to the bank you have to go to the financial institution where you and hopefully you have a relationship that's good enough with that bank um or a credit union um and in some cases you know people dealt with third party uh, vendors who processed the loan and then submitted that application to the bank but the sba doesn't have access to the front end information now once the bank uh, receives the application they do the processing on their end yeah, they'll I, send it they'll send it over to us for funding yeah i'm sorry no, no. funding compliance messages oh you broke up a yeah, little no, bit no. i'll 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 step in because what he's saying of course is accurate that you know what we do is we submit the ppp loan and we get the response back from the sba for their you know if it was rejected if it's accepted um again Kudos to First Citizens that we had a thorough process on the front end, so we didn't really deal with that too much. Um, we underwrote it before, so we catch it at that underwriting stage internally, and then, hey, actually this figure is wrong. Like in the calculator that we provided clients where they just had to plug in numbers, right? So we see you put this there, but when we looked at the financials, it actually needs to be this. We need you to correct it. So it breaks my heart that people are coming to you, Brian, and, and asking and not knowing why. Again, because some just put it on an online platform where you kind of submitted it yourself. And then somewhere within that process, the bank is receiving that denial and a reason. Um, it may be vague, um, but they somehow should be disseminating that to the client through that online portal when they submitted it. And there should be some communication back to it. Or if you know you um, call a number, you know 1-800 and had to submit. There should be some type of contact within the bank that can pull that information and tell you. Um, here it would be we caught it in the front end and we didn't have the problem in the first place. 
in most cases, but it would be calling me, right? So we would have got that and I would have reached out to the client. Unfortunately, not everybody did it that way. Um, so, but the bank has it. The bank has that information somewhere the SBA gave them a response. So reach out to your bank. Um, I will say most banks do have a dedicated like line or department that's trying to handle these um, requests. So it's, it's there somewhere within the bank. The information is there. Just track it down, find it, try to get a hold of somebody. You've only got a little bit of time, and I want to clarify it has to be funded by the 31st. So that means the process needs to be done like yesterday. So it, it, you could still get it done. You know, it's possible. It doesn't hurt to try, and then you'll know you at least put forth your best effort. Um, but, yeah, the information is somewhere at the bank. I would, I would reach out to whoever you processed it through or if you did one of those online lenders. They've got to have a 1-800 or something dedicated to this. So. Okay. Well, uh, again, thanks for those answers. And I think one of the uh, points that both of them came up with is you got to know who you got to know. So get to know your banker so that when these situations pop up, you can give them a call. Um, it's very important. So with that, I want to wrap this session up and, and thank Julie and thank Thaddeus again for this information. Um, if you guys have any more questions, keep typing them. Uh, we'll get to them and we will answer them later. Now I'd like to move on to our next portion. Uh, and that is uh, with a couple of friends of mine from the local Jack's Chamber that I've had the uh, pleasure of working with. Um, and, and that is uh, Jackie Gary, who is the director of the Jacksonville Women's Business Center and Dr. Carlton Robinson, who is the Chief Innovation Officer for the Jacks Chamber. And they've both been heavily involved in working with small businesses. Um, well, that's what they do. Uh, entrepreneurial uh, things are what they are. So what I'm going to do, uh, instead of me going on and on telling you how great they are, because I will say this, and I'm going to stop it here. Carlton was one of the very first people that I came into contact with in Jacks, uh, Jacksonville as I was in one of their programs for budding entrepreneurs. And so uh, he was one of the first uh, through career source <laughs> that I met. And, and six years later, it's getting better and better. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to you guys and uh, Carlton and Jackie, take it away. Thanks for having us. Jackie, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. Um, yes, thank you all for joining us for our portion of onboarding and success. My name is Jackie Geary. I'm the director of the Jacksonville Women's Business Center. I'm really proud to be here and we've got a um, couple things we wanna discuss with you. If we can advance to our next slide, we'll go to our talking points for today. Um, but yeah, so I'm the director of the Women's Business Center. The work that I do here is to oversee the economic development and expansion of women-owned businesses in our region. Um, I'll let Carlton introduce himself. Um, my name is Carlton Robinson. And uh, when I first met uh, Brian, we were working with um, Career Source with a program called uh, Startup Quest. And our goal was to take people uh, that may have been in transition and to teach them uh, different aspects of uh, not necessarily owning a business, but developing a business. And uh, we've run not only that program, but several others, including uh, Jack's Bridges. And i um, happy to be here today and, and share a little insight. Awesome. We can go to the next slide. Um, that's really just kind of the overview of who we are. Uh, at the end of this, too, we're going to share our LinkedIn. So we uh, would love for you to connect with us so we can continue our conversations uh, and get to know everybody a little bit better. Um, and thank you, Brian, for putting this together. For our portion, what I wanna kick off and start is by talking about supplier diversity. We recently did a program uh, with the Women's Business Center on supplier diversity. And what does that mean? Um, supplier diversity aims to create an inclusive supply chain of comprised of diverse vendors, such as women, minority, veteran-owned businesses, LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, and we were proud to put on this program, which was not exclusive to women. I wanna let you know, we do uh, let men uh, join into our programs and our education efforts, uh, but we encourage the development of the supplier diversity. 
And the benefits of that were um, that we were able to promote innovation and introduce new products and services for solutions for business owners. Uh, we also were able to aid in the impact of economic development in some of our areas and promote business owners in their communities to help them grow. Um, cool story that we were actually, you know, during the pandemic and last year, we actually went out into Springfield and met several of, um, there's actually an entire row in Springfield of women owned businesses. We did a, a ribbon cutting for ice capade frozen treats. So it's opportunities like that, uh, that we're able to showcase and share and expand and let people know of the successes that we have and why it's so important for us to do so. Um, we also were able to help that business owner be promoted on the news channel and connect with Tanika Hughes when she was doing some of those efforts on diversity and business owners. Um, and from that, we learned a lot. And that's why we think that supplier diversity is such an important topic and such an important program that we should be offering. Um, Carlton, what is some of your feedback from the supplier diversity program that we did here at the Chamber and with the Women's Business Center? Um, one that was, I think it may be the first time that we actually had that specific offering. Um, and, you know, we had met with Kathy on a different project and she had shared with us some insight on things she'd done at the University of Florida. And we thought it was a good fit for our community. And um, I would say, you know, the feedback from the participants um, was overwhelming. And I think we'll wind up doing it at least one more time uh, this year, uh, just because of the amount of interest that we had. And, and one of the keys with supplier diversity, and some of us were on a call earlier this week, um, we have to gain insight on how best to communicate and interact with corporations. And that changes on a regular basis. So, you know, Brian and all of our authorities here in Jacksonville do a great job, but as things change for them, we have to make sure as a resource provider, we're updating participants. Um, I think we're getting better, but there's always room for improvement for us in helping to educate small business owners and entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And I think too, it's, you know, it's being that application ready and having that preparedness. It goes back to the previous conversations that we've had today and, you know, just being ready to go and do something like this. Um, the quote that we have here in the presentation is from Kathy Porter. Uh, she's actually certified to teach supplier diversity and had teach, uh, taught the cohort for us. We'll be doing another one in the fall. Uh, Brian successfully went through the entire cohort with us and graduated with a certificate. And um, we think it was, we had a lot of good feedback from that program. So that tells us that it's extremely needed and that we can only expand and grow this better. Um, I wanna say another benefit from probably doing supplier diversity is that it drives competition, um, not just by price, but also by service. So it's creating this competitive, innovative space for our region in North Florida that can only help put us more on the map, so. It's exciting. Um, with that, uh, we can advance the slide and move on into a little bit of our digital transformation. Yes, so, um, you know, one of the things Brian uh, asked us to do as a part of our conversation with you is, you know, number one, um, you know, kind of give insight on how we can all be better as business owners and resource providers with COVID. And uh, so we thought it would be good for us to kind of share with you some things that we did, um, you know, during the pandemic that helped us, you know, be better supporters of small businesses and entrepreneurs. And then uh, also these same tools and experiences are beneficial to you as a business owner, because all of us now have to kind of upgrade our ability to leverage technology to communicate with Brian um, all of the authorities and all of the corporations. So for us, um, you know, one of our, our approaches is we had to take a look at, you know, what I would call the innovator's journey or what small business owners actually experience. So uh, business processes, there's a customer experience, there's different channels of distribution, there's digitizing, you know, things that we used to do manually. And as you think about doing business with the port, the airport, uh, JTA, the city, 
and I'm just naming them because they're all uh, public entities, um, there's a certain business process that they have to follow. And so as soon as we can you know, get in contact with, with Brian, uh, we need to inquire about what are the specific business processes. Is he gonna require us to uh, go and register for a specific portal? Is he gonna require us to uh, go to his website and actually download specific forms and complete those in order to begin the process? Those are things that we have to uh, make sure we identify as small business owners and entrepreneurs. And this is something that we had to do uh, here at the Jack's Chamber uh, as we had to transition from pre-COVID to you know, whatever we're in, we're in right now. Uh, the second thing that we needed to do was you know, really um, was to, oh, can you go back one slide? This one is a, a really busy one, so I don't want to take them there yet. Um, so the second thing we had to do was uh, think about the customer experience. So for everyone that's on the call with us today, um, when you interact with either another vendor or someone that may be a supplier, like what access do they have to you and how easy is it to connect to you? So some of us, um, you know, we may have issues today with um, specific webinar software. So, you know, sometimes we're going to fall off of a call. Um, are we in a good place to actually conduct business when it comes to connectivity and access? Now, we still struggle with some of those things um, just because of the volume of people that may be on. But as a small business owner, you've got to make sure that you know, you have a really good Zoom account, you know, go ahead and pay, I don't know, what is it, $15 a month or something like that um, to upgrade a little bit. So, you know, you have more than 40 minutes uh, if you have to engage clients, um, you know, having different things like uh, I'm, I'm not endorsing the products. I'm just sh sharing with you what we may use, but uh, something like Calendly, where um, you can set appointments and allow people to uh, kind of meet with you at specific times. So those are things that were new for us um, during the pandemic, and uh, they've worked out really, really well. Uh, the bottom one there, the channels of distribution, um, we really had to focus on, you know, how do I get my information and how do I get connected to the people that are in my supply chain. So Julie and Thaddeus were on earlier and they were talking about lending. Um, lending has its own supply chain. So even though you may have an SBA loan, there's a, there's a, you know, a series of relationships that you need to have to actually get to the funding. And so when we talk about a channel of distribution, we have to make sure that, you know, we define those for, um, our products and services, but then also for lending opportunities. And then, you know, with digitization, um, that's really just, you know, automating some of the things that we used to do uh, manually. So uh, Jackie's going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, if we could advance to the next slide, the really busy one. Um, <laughs> so uh, these are just some of the different um, products that we actually used um, to you know, change how we support entrepreneurs um, here in Jacksonville. Uh, some of them we've had for a number of years, but in terms of business processes, uh, most of these are, are relatively cheap. Um, you know, we have uh, Zendesk where you know, we can send people to a help desk to answer questions in case they can't you know, get a hold of us, or they can send us inquiries directly. So all of that is automated. And before, you know, we mainly focused on um, our phones, which is not good, and email. Uh, on the customer experience, we use a lot of online forms. And for you as business owners, these are things that you can use um, to uh, take in information, even from uh, vendors as well as suppliers. And then obviously uh, the online elements. So all of these things helped us to make a digital transformation to actually support entrepreneurs. And I think what you'll see is, um, you know, many organizations will start to do uh, the same things. 
So uh, if you could go one more slide for me, uh, and I'll just share with you in making that digital transformation, uh, the benefit that it's had for us. So the business processes, now we're more automated, we're able to connect to uh, more entrepreneurs, uh, we're able to direct them better. So as we're taking in information, we can take a look at it um, you know, at different times of the day and forward that information to our partners. Uh, there's greater access and connectivity. And uh, I think overall, you know, Jackie will tell me if I'm, I'm right or not, but I think our decision-making is much better um, because we have more information and we're, we're able to uh, get people to the right place in, in a very efficient time. Uh, because of all of this, uh, we actually developed a, a, a program called our Network of Trust, where we're able to support entrepreneurs remotely. And uh, we will have a, a project, I think, in the third quarter, um, where we'll do a partnership with uh, the authorities to help onboard people remotely. But uh, I'm going to let Jackie kind of talk, talk about our Network of Trust, and then I'll be available for questions at the end. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carlton. So um, we're going to go to, yes, this slide's perfect. So um, in speaking about the network of trust, really quick, I kind of want to paint a picture, if I may. Um, so if you're going out for these government contracts, something that's extremely important and you should already have or know about is your capability statement. Uh, what is your capability statement? It is a living document that should change depending on the targeted agency that you're going after for those um, fulfilled contracts. So you want to always develop a master copy, tailor it to a government sector, and then project or sources sought your, as needed. So make sure you, all of your certifications are on there. So if you are a WOSB, women-owned small business, economically disadvantaged women-owned small business, veteran-owned small business, et cetera, all of those certifications should be on your capability statement. And that's a one-page document. Uh, that should include some things. So I'm going to give you a couple, a little bit of a list that that should include, and then I'll go into why this is so important for what we do. Um, so that capability and statement should include your core competencies, your differentiators, past performance, company data, and then your contact information. And a well-written capability statement is going to open up many, many doors for you. Um, that's really your business resume on paper. Um, it's what businesses are going to look at when they want to know who you are before you can actually maybe get some of those meetings or in, your foot in the door. Um, so look at it as a business resume and make sure that is a one page document. It can be front and back, um, but it should be very clear and concise. And we have some documents and some uh, preferred mentors that are uh, certified on behalf of the chamber and the Women's Business Center. Uh, we've got Alfreda Boney as one of them, and we've got others as well, but they're able to help you build that capability statement. Um, and we do that in Jack's Bridges. So what do you, real quick, Carlton, what do you think, um, you know, the importance of the capability statement? How has that helped the Jack's Bridges folks uh, be successful? Um, you know, first, we've, we've partnered with all of the authorities in the Jack's Bridges program. So we've been lucky enough to uh, get insight from them as to what they see and how to best prepare uh, small business owners to engage with them. And I would say, you know, number one is making sure that you have all of those elements that you mentioned. Um, and number two would be um, often we're not able to communicate clearly what we do when we introduce ourselves, um, you know, at an event. And so if we were meeting with Brian, what we should do, obviously, uh, we may have our business card, but that capability statement is like a leave behind that Brian can store. And so he may not have an opportunity for you today, but you know, within his files, um, he may be able to take a look and say, you know, we have a person uh, that I met two months ago that left me a capability statement who would be a good fit for this. And that doesn't always work with the business card. And so uh, we have to do a better job as resource providers, as helping you know, uh, small business owners prepare educate them on some tips that can help them stand out from others. Um, but we've got lots of success stories here in Northeast Florida 
um, of those using the capability statement, um, you know, to get an opportunity to either pitch their company or win a contract. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You know, the U.S. government is the largest purchaser of goods and services in the country. And, you know, 23 percent of all federal purchases are fulfilled by small businesses. So it's extremely important to know that information and be set up for success. Um, and that's why we're here to help you prepare. Um, so with that, you know, painting that picture of that capability statement. And if you are in that process of editing it or maybe I've never created one, we identified that was just one iteration that we identified that we needed to start getting immediate feedback, timely feedback. Um, it was hard for folks to navigate the ecosystem. You hear there's resources out there for your small business, but how am I going to find these resources? How do I navigate them? How do they intertwine and work together? Um, and it can become very consuming, very daunting and scary. Um, so we wanted to kind of explain the process. And then what we did with this was we were able to onboard other resource partners and have them participate in this, um, which we think was just a fascinating pro uh, program called the Network of Trust. So, um, you know, as we know with COVID, we had limited physical locations. We were supporting at the Jack's Chamber and at the Women's Business Center, especially, we were supporting business owners, not just that were in Duval County or not just that were able to get here, but in rural counties um, and areas that are outside of the seven county region. And those business owners needed us in North Florida because of the expertise that we have. Um, so we were able to come up with a program that ideally gives you a portfolio at the end of the day of your business um, with looping feedback. If we can go um, to the next slide, please. So how this kind of worked, we identified that we needed to improve the mentee viability. What that means is we set aside some goals. And one of those, of course, was the real-time feedback and building trust. Um, that's why it's called the network of trust, because these providers and these mentors who are giving you feedback are going to be doing it on a level of expertise that they know your business. We have vetted them and pre-selected uh, expertises so that if you need help on capability statement, you're going to get that mentor and that certified person in our uh, organization that's able to help you with that. You need help with revenue models. You're going to get somebody like Carlton who's able to really focus and understand your revenue models more. Um, so it was very tailored, hyper-connective mentoring process. Our program takes place within uh, 48 hours. So essentially you would submit your questions for your capability statement, we'll stick on that. So you submit your capability statement, you can probably attach a document if you've started it, and you can start to ask some questions. Uh, within 48 hours, that document and that feedback that you've given is gonna come into the network of trust and you'll be assigned a provider. That mentor provider is then going to do research, understand your business, and give you the best expertise and feedback on how you can grow in that area, your capability statement. That is all documented then into a PDF format and emailed not only to you as the mentee, but also to the mentor. Again, building that portfolio for you. Uh, what we saw in the past, you know, folks would come in or we would have strategic meetings. You would be taking your own notes and I would have my own set of notes. And at the end of the day, sometimes those notes did not always end up on the same document, living document. Um, this network of trust is really building that portfolio that we know that at the chamber that we can give you this portfolio to then go bid out for those contracts, prove your existence, prove your viability in this market and get you a strong answer. Um, or just have a, um, a conversation with, you know, it could be a SCORE mentor, could be, you know, the Small Business Development Center. Um, you know, our, our goal is to help contribute to the ecosystem. Um, we understand, you know, what we're good at, and then we can turn it over to one of our other partners. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great point because we know businesses are moving to Florida and we've talked to business owners who are moving to Jacksonville. Well, what happens if they, you know, score SBDC, the women's business centers for all across the country? What happens if you had all of this great mentorship and you want to bring this down, you know, to Jacksonville, to North Florida, and you didn't have that in a portfolio? We're able to help provide this on a national level to all of those resource par partners to help build this stronger case for the business owners that we have. 
Um, it was really built uh, for the business owner and by a business owner. Um, so I'll go to the next slide and I'll kind of explain the customer journey. Um, so you would qualify to participate in the network of trust means that you've had some sort of introduction with the Women's Business Center, the Jack's Chamber, or perhaps the Jack's Bridges program. So that means that you've had a conversation with us and we're starting to understand where you at level wise and where you need this mentorship or assistance. Uh, so this is helpful for us because if you go into the network of trust and we don't have this pre-conversation, we're not able to guide you as more efficiently. Uh, the program then takes place with over two weeks and we have 48 hours uh, from the mentor side to provide that feedback. And then as Carlton mentioned, uh, the furthermore, you would get connected with resource providers, other um, resources within the Pivot City network or referred to a future program hosted by the Entrepreneurial Growth Division. Um, and then next, I wanna share with you just kind of what's on the horizon. So where have we been? What have we been doing and how does this all fit? Um, with this program and what we're able to do, we've been launched, we've recently launched this week, a hyper-connected mentoring program for women business owners to be able to submit their canvases, submit their capability and their value propositions. And we will be reviewing them and making them application ready, mentor ready um, for what hopes to be a long year long mentorship program. Carlton, you want to touch on Bridge to Business and Open Innovation? Yeah, I, you know, overall, I, I think um, for us, we really took advantage of um, the pandemic, and that sounds weird, but, you know, we used that time to, um, you know, become, you know, more digital savvy, uh, upgrade our technology, and uh, we have a goal you know, of having um, the best women's business center in the country. I think um, Jackie is doing a really good job um, integrating technology to deliver services on a much broader level. And, um, you know, it, the better we are, uh, the more we can actually help um, our partners. And um, as I mentioned before, one of the things that we uh, plan to do, hopefully in the third quarter, is uh, take the network of trust and have a partnership with the authorities um, where we can do a portion of the onboarding uh, remotely. And so as people come in and, um, you know, they're interested in working with Brian or any of the other authorities uh, remotely, uh, we may be able to support that process. We still have some things to work out, but I think it's one uh, process here in Northeast Florida where we can lead the country and doing something innovative for small business owners and entrepreneurs. And once we have that process in place, um, we can just be more efficient. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, to share. And if there's any questions, um, Jackie and I are available. Yes, thank you so much, Brian, for the invitation to share. Um, we are definitely available for, you know, connections on LinkedIn, if anybody has any questions about the software. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, we, just like every other business owner, had to adapt and test and trial everything, going back to that, um, the platforms that we use. So we uh, totally understand, you know, some work, some don't, and some we're still figuring out. Um, so it's been a journey, I think, for everybody. But with that, we're going to be a stronger North Florida, I know. So we'll we'll say because we're friends, uh, Brian, you need to ask us at least two questions, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I, I appreciate you um, guys, uh, you two, for coming on and, and spending uh, uh, the time with us. Uh, I'm trying to, um, one of the programs that I've worked with uh, you guys is the Jack's Bridges. How can people get in touch with you so they can start this process? Uh, for Jack's Bridges, they can go to uh, jacksbridges.com, J-A-X-B-R-I-D-G-E-S.com, and they can just sign up for updates. And, um, you know, we always have that up and, and with our next uh, cohort, uh, we'll actually be changing the format of Jack's Bridges after the current cohort. Uh, we're going to increase the frequency 
So we'll do smaller sessions, but increased frequency because of the new tools that we have. Uh, so we'll be announcing some new offerings uh, within the next month or so related to Jack's Bridges so people don't have to wait as long. Good. And um, one more question on this for Jackie. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in uh, Kathy Porter's session. Um, but how can uh, women-owned businesses get in contact with you so that they can uh, be able to be noticed when these things arise. Absolutely. So I asked if you would go to our website, jackswbc.com, um, and sign up for our newsletter. So I will get your email if you sign up for updates, and I'll connect with you and invite you to do a mini counseling session or to you know understand all of the different workings of the Women's Business Center, and then how we also collaborate. You know, we work with the SBA, of course, they fund us. So thank you, Thaddeus, always for being um, such a big supporter and help with everything. And you know, how we work with SCORE and the SBDC, we're constantly promoting and trying to be a voice for the small business community and help everybody navigate that. That's something I think I do well is navigating the ecosystem. So I welcome all of you to connect with me, LinkedIn or on our website. That's great. And um, again, I want to thank you. I am uh, want to thank everybody who has participated today. We have a, a, a another special segment that I, I, I want to get into, um, and that's for people who are interested in learning how to navigate um, the Jacksport system as it stands today. Um, but I, I want to make sure that uh, I thank uh, Councilman Freeman uh, I, I want to make sure, uh, again, uh, Julie and Thaddeus and all the members of our panel uh, who put in the time to sit down and answer these questions. Um, and I, I really, really appreciate the fact that we all understand that this is all about Jacksonville, small business, and we appreciate everything you do. And we appreciate the service you provide because we all need it. Um, and we want, it, want you to understand that uh, we are available um, and we're here to help you make that connection to our different entities. I also wanna tell you a little bit about the future. Um, um, as we move digitally, we plan on rolling out some digital workshops. Uh, again, our workshops are gonna be geared towards the topics that um, you, the audience, our audience find interesting um, so that you can send me emails uh, about what you would like to see. I already have some people lined up who are willing to uh, spend their time to give you advice and information on how to make your business successful. So look out for that in the very near future. Uh, there'll be short, brief uh, informational sessions, um, which will concentrate on just one topic that can help you uh, navigate um, this business. So uh, without, without further ado, um, I want to say um, our special bonus segment, and uh, I'm gonna bring Retta back on, and Retta's gonna work with you um, to show you how easy it is, you know, to do business uh, with Jacksport and through our system. So again, I, I want to say that in one of our upcoming sessions, um, as we progress in this digital age and as we progress into a more uh, functional or, or more uh, streamlined system. We'll be back on to tell you more about the new system when it becomes available. But for right now, uh, if you want to do business, if you want to uh, bid uh, on on uh, proposals that are coming through Jacksport, I'm going to let Retta walk you through this. Um, so Retta, take it away. Okay, Brian, thank you for uh, inviting me back so that I can just show a brief session of how uh, how easy it is for us to, for you to bid on one of our contracts or to upload your documents on one of our contracts. So I actually need control, uh, presenter control.
Are you able to see my screen? We're not seeing the internet. You're not uh, seeing it? No. Yeah, we're seeing a screen. Uh oh, looks like it might be gummy. I'm not sure. Can you try pulling it over to a different monitor? Yes, let me try to do that. Are you seeing anything now? Yes. Okay, so you see my email. Correct. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that, that happens when you want to bid on a project with Jacksport is if you contact us directly, you will receive, or sometimes you are just, if you're part of our uh, bidding process or our, our bidding database, we will send you an invitation to bid. And so that comes directly to you by email. And if you look in my email box right now, I have two emails, uh, both from Jerry Gunder, which is the contract specialist that sent out the bid. She sent the original bid and she sent an addenda. So you can actually access the bid through the original bid or the addenda. And this is what your invitation would look like. This actually, this is actually a test bid for RFQ for wild hog removal services for the Jacksonville Port Authority. And just like our uh, document sh shows that it's a it's a very easy process. It's a three steps basically. So once you receive your invitation to bid, you can actually go click right here where it says you have been invited to a bid and click to gain access to the project bid documents. So you, once you're already registered with our system, you go in there, put in your login and password. <clears throat> and it'll actually bring you into the bidding module where you have, uh, you have your bid package invitation, you have your response form, and then you have a, the ability to uh, do question and, questions and answers if you need to do so. So I'm just going to give you a few tips. I'm going to open my bid form that I completed at the time so that you can see what my bid form looks like. <clears throat> And as a responder, you want to make sure that you read those bid documents completely. You want to read your bid documents before you start to prepare your proposal. You want to make sure that you sign and notarize any documents that are necessary. If it asks for a signature, you want to make sure that you sign that. If it asks for a notary, you want to make sure those documents get notarized. Uh, because you do not want to submit a bid and then you are deemed non-conforming or non-responsive because you forgot something that they asked. So if you notice with this particular bid document, it says, please submit the following uh, items with your quote form. They want evidence that the company is licensed to do business in the state of Florida. They want copies of uh, requested license and permits required to perform these services. It's asking for authorization agent uh, acknowledgement form. It's asking for acknowledgement of any addenda. So there was one addenda. It's asking for a conflict of interest statement. It's asking for a sworn statement of public entity crime and it's asking for e-verified compliance. So when not only with your bid form, it's asking that you submit all of these documents back. And so you wanna make sure as a contractor that you submit those documents back, otherwise you could be deemed non-conforming. And it's, it also tells you on your bid form, failure to provide above information in stated format may be result in rejection of proposal. So you wanna make sure that you provide the information as just as the agency has asked for. So I'm gonna drop my bid form again, and I'm gonna, this is my folder. I have all of my documents. If you notice, I put my conflict of interest. You have to make sure that all your documents are uh, in PDF format. <clears throat> and then make sure that you have them in one central location. So when you get ready to submit that bid, because there is a time limit. It tells you what time you have to get these bids in. And if you miss that time limit, you, you can lose out on this bid. So make sure all of your documents are contained in one location so that when you get ready to submit, it will be an easy process. So I'm gonna drop that screen. I'm gonna go back to the bid package. <clears throat> so the response form, it's asking me to put in, I actually bid it 175 per unit of 
the 50 quantity, and it's automatically going to give me the, the, my total bid, 8,750. I've also completed that bid form that I'm going to include in that. So now I filled out <clears throat> the amount that I want to bid. Then I have to go to my response documents. Any document that they ask me to, to include in my bid, I need to go ahead and attach those documents. So I just click right there. And I browse for my documents. Go to my folder. And here are all my documents. I'm going to put acknowledgement of my agenda. and upload it. My conflict of interest. My e verify form. So, as I'm doing this, I'm checking all of these things off of my list, making sure that I include everything that they ask for. My PEC form. Most importantly, my bid form, although I put the amount in there, but I have to put my bid form because that's where my uh, acknowledgement of where I signed the bid form, that part is there. So I'm going to add that. And the last thing it was asking for was an addenda, acknowledgement of the addenda. So there's two ways to acknowledge your addenda, and I would do both. You can actually sign the form that says acknowledge addenda. I'm going to add it here and upload it. <clears throat> And then when you go to additional required documents, it asks you, I have read and agreed to the terms of addendum number one. I want to make sure I check that box. And any additional documents that are, are required, you would upload those additional documents. So I have included all of my documents here that, that were requested. I have acknowledged my addenda. I have included my addenda. I have completed my bid form. And it says that that bid is due to uh, March the 24th by 2 p.m. And it, it literally cuts off right at 2 p.m. You will not be able to add anything, anything after that time. So I have everything prepared and I'm ready to submit. I would always do a double, a double check just to make sure everything's there, go through my checklist. Acknowledge my agenda, filled my bid form out. And also, if you had any type of questions or answers, you can go right here to ask your questions. It would just be simply here. Start to type, submit your question, and send it over. <clears throat> so I'm ready to submit. Go back to my invitation package. I said accept. And I'm ready to submit. And it's going to ask me to enter my eBuilder password again. And there it is. If you look at my screen right here where my cursor is at, I don't know if you can see it. It says submitted on 3-24-2021 at 12-16 p.m. So I did meet my 2 p.m deadline and I have it in. And that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that you give yourself enough time so that you can add all of your forms and make sure that they get in on time and uh, so that we will receive them. Otherwise, like I said, at 2 p.m., the bidding closes right at 2 p.m. and there's no further forms that you can add. So if you're in the middle of it, you have any type of technical difficulties and it turns into 201, you won't be able to submit that bid. So um, 
what we do is in all of our bid packages, we include the steps of how to submit your bid form in eBuilder, but also as a part of this package for forms that are going to be sent out, that's included in there also. And then also uh, Jacksport, our procurement staff, we're readily available to help you. If you need help, we have on our staff, we have Brian Williams, myself, Retta Rogers, which is the manager of procurement services. We have Sandra Platt, she's our senior contract specialist, and we have Jerry Gunder, who is a contract specialist. You can at any time give us a call, we can assist you. Uh, if there's technical difficulties with our eBuilder, eBuilder provides a 1-800 number that you can actually use and call and they can uh, talk you through the process. But we're, again, we are always here and available for you. If uh, I have I have nothing else, so I'm just going to turn that camera back over to Brian. We want to thank you for uh, your opportunity. We want to thank you for doing business with Jacksport, and I will turn it back over to Brian so that we can end the session. Okay, thank you again, Retta. Again, that was just our little added bonus, and I want to thank you all who stayed on because it's, it's important um, that you understand how we operate. And again, I would ask that you connect with each of the other entities and agencies that were on here today and ask them for information on how to use their system. Um, it's very important, knowledge is key. Um, one thing that uh, like the city uh, and like J JTA and also ourselves, we will be going through changes, constantly trying to improve ourselves so that we can serve you better and so that you can get connected to us better. It's a constant improvement and it's what makes Jacksport uh, stay ahead of the game. So again, thank you so much uh, for participating. Uh, we will be back, getting back in touch with you. Um, I, I think I have a questionnaire. Do I have, is that? Yeah, so pay attention because there will be a little survey very quick um, and then I'll probably be getting back in touch with you to ask you more about what it is you want us to, to uh, serve you in the future. So thanks again and I'm signing off and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, I have a question. Where do small businesses go to register to bid with Jacksport? Uh, one is uh, jacksport.com. Uh, if you go to jacksport.com and you click on our procurement tab, uh, a drop down screen will show uh, what's what's it called, Retta? The um, it's just a vendor form. Yeah, it's a vendor application. Mm -hmm. So, and it's and it's uh, one minute long. Uh, and once you submit that, you will get notice from uh, Jerry Gunder or Sandra that we received uh, your vendor registration. Uh, and then at that point, we insert you into the system so that you'll be notified based on your codes that you uh, gave us um, to put in the system. This is one way in which we are able to reach out to you. So it's best uh, once you um, put in your vendor application, you know, that you um, reply uh, when you get your email that you received it and that you're good to go. Um, at that point, then as Retta said earlier, as bids go out, we send out notices to those uh, coordinating uh, codes and also to, um, to our different entities, uh, especially in the small business uh, brackets, um, so that you get notice of the um, proposal and then it goes to what Rutter just showed you. You'll get an email that says there's a bid and it will give you all the instructions on how to bid. Uh, one more thing, another question. How do we go about scheduling meetings to introduce our company? My number, 904-357-3444. My email, brian.williams at jacksport.com. That's Brian with an I, B-R-I-A-N, 
and I will definitely get back with you. Matter of fact, I look forward to you um, contacting me. Um, and so we can sit down and discuss what it is your business does and some of the things that are coming up and how we can best connect for you in the future. Again, Brian Williams, brian.williams at jacksport.com and 904-357-3003. And uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you very much. See you around. Thank you, Ryan.